Okay, so alignments will be um, more the theory of the alignments, the different angles, all the terms, some stuff like this that I was showing you in the centric, but the most valuable is going to be doing the alignment in the shop. So there's going to be a demonstration video that you're going to watch and answer some questions on. And those combined will have you pretty prepared, I think, to do an actual alignment. So here we go. It's unit seven. <clears throat> All right. First things first, why would we do an alignment? So these are the reasons. Uh, most common is customer has had new tires installed and we may sell or recommend an alignment simply to prolong the life of their tires. And that's just maintenance. It's not to say you need an alignment. I would be very careful about how I word that. I've had a lot of people in the past say, I went to do tires and they said I need an alignment. And, and that may be true, but if you look at the tires and the tires are wearing really well, I wouldn't say you need an alignment is a true statement. I would say you should consider doing alignment to help these tires last as long as possible. Um, but just be careful with your words. The second reason, customers experience in, in experiencing an alignment related issue. So the number one and number two, and I'm not sure in which order would be a pull or a steering wheel off center. So they get in the car, and they're going down the road, but the steering wheel's like this to go straight, that would be a good reason to request an alignment or to have an alignment done. Or um, <clears throat> I'd like to clarify what a pull is. A pull is actually a force that's being applied on your steering wheel. So if you let go of your steering wheel, you cross your arms like this, and if the car goes to one side or the other, that's not really a pull. We'd actually more call that a drift. A drift is when the car kind of drifts one way or another. A drift is more likely to be like a very slight pull. A, a pull per se would be your hands are on the wheel. You you kind of you kind of relax your muscles and you feel the steering wheel pulling you one direction. That's an actual pull. Um, so just clarifying with the customer would be good, and also for you to clarify. Just because the steering wheel is off center, that doesn't make it a pull right? It's, it's all on how it feels. And then there's a third uh, potential that the customer's feeling, and that's a shimmy. What a shimmy is, you're going down the road, and it's almost like a brake pulsation, but you're not pressing the brakes. It's just shaking. Typically, you know, maybe at highway speed. And so nine out of 10 times, and probably more, probably, probably more like 99 out of 100 times, we're dealing with something with the tire. Tire balance, tire at a round, tire has road force variation, and all that stuff that we can hook up on the nice um, road force balancer. We can get a measurement on the road force balancer. We can determine if that's in spec on the road force balancer, and then we can potentially fix it with a phase match. Um, but there is a possibility that the customer has actually insufficient caster and if their caster is lower than spec it can uh and we'll explain it a little bit more later but that can actually make the steering wheel shimmy it'd be a lot more prone to shimming the example that i think of is uh the shopping cart if you use a shopping cart now i'm going to show you something <clears throat> if you use a shopping cart and here's my arms these are the caster a shopping cart tends to be a little negative caster, so they're back here. You ever notice those wheels, like if you're pushing a shopping cart really fast, those shopping cart wheels, they tend to like go around like this. Basically, that's the shimmy. The shimmy is due to caster being low. But how often? Not real often. Just maybe sometimes. Um, and then the, the third reason would be a uh, technician, that'd be you, and, and maybe the customer, but the customer doesn't typically notice, but probably you notice abnormal tire wear related to alignment angles. So we may have toe wear, we may have camber wear. You should be able to identify that. And even if they're not replacing the tires, recommending an alignment at that point is, um, that's a good service to the customer. And then fourth and final, <clears throat> if an adjustable steering or suspension part is replaced. 
So I really want to clarify this because I've there's so much bad information out there. If you're working on a car and you replace, um, let's say, a mm, a leaf spring, the leaf spring is not adjustable. So you unbolt the leaf spring, you bolt the leaf spring back in. Do you need an alignment? No. Is it a good idea to do alignment? It's always a good idea to do an alignment, especially when it's something like a spring because that can affect ride height, which can affect some things. But it's not adjustable. So to say you need an alignment is just really not true. So let's say you were to replace um, a control arm, right? A control arm and a, and a Camry. You're going to unbolt the control arm from the subframe and you're going to unbolt the ball joint from the knuckle and you're going to take it out and you're going to put it back in. And there's two bolts. There's usually one that's sideways and there's usually one that's up and down. Are either of those adjustable? No. You take the bolt out, you put the bolt in. And then the ball joint, a lot of times that's the, the pinch style bolt now, or even if it was the castle nut type, or sometimes we'll just unbolt the unbolt the ball joint from the control arm. However you do it, is that adjustable? No. So do you need an alignment after you do a control arm? I would firmly say no. Is it a good idea? Sure. But an alignment's a good idea like periodically anyway, because you know, you hit all it takes is you hit one pothole and you can slightly damage and bend something and your alignment's no longer on. So we just gotta be really careful with what we say. If we're doing work and you tell a customer they need an alignment, that could be seen as you're implying that it does need an alignment in the way that let's say we do a tie rod in. Now a tie rod in, when we go to do that, we're gonna crack the lock nut loose. We're gonna unthread the tie rod all the way off. Then we're gonna thread the new tie rod all the way on. That's adjustable. Do you think we got that tie rod end to the exact same spot of the old tie rod end? Probably not. And you would, and even if you did, you're assuming that new tie rod end is identical, identical in every way. If it's OEM, yeah, maybe it should be. But if if it was OEM and we're putting an aftermarket part on, you know, that tie rod can vary a little bit. Tie rod end. Or even on the other way, if it was aftermarket, we put OEM, or it was aftermarket and we put a different brand of aftermarket, you're making a lot of assumptions. Now, I agree, markers are your friends on tie rods. You see that? I agree, making a mark is absolutely a lifesaver because you want to get the tie rod as close as possible. But to fine tune it, you really need to roll that car over to the alignment rack and that would need an alignment because you replaced an adjustable part. And that's why I made adjustable really big here. I wanna make sure you understand. Now, some things are a little more um, gray. So if you replace struts, sometimes struts are direct bolt in and you're done. Other times struts actually have an eccentric like this, in which case you have to unthread the bolt. See why I chased this bolt down? You have to unthread this bolt. Well, you actually unthread the nut really. And then you drive the bolt out. When you put it back in, yeah, you can make a mark and you could probably get it pretty close, but it's tough to say if you get it exactly the same. And additionally, that new coil spring, if you've replaced a strut as an assembly with the coil spring, you don't know that that coil spring is going to be maybe slightly changing your ride height. Your ride height is actually going to change your caster and your camber. And so a strut's one of those things where, you know, on, on one car, it, it may not need an alignment, but on another car with an eccentric in it, it does need an alignment. And it's kind of a, kind of depends on a, on a case to case basis. Um, and so those are the reasons we do an alignment, but before we get all crazy into alignments, you need to understand what the alignment is. And then even we're going to talk about um, some things that relate to alignment that are not exactly alignment. So purpose of an alignment, all the wheels of a vehicle must be correctly positioned in relation to the vehicle and to one another. So some alignment angles are basically the wheels position to the vehicle and other alignment angles are the front wheels position 
in relation to the rear wheels position. And that's kind of interesting. And basically the job of the whole suspension system is to keep those wheels where they're supposed to be. But the minute fine details of adjustments, that's the alignment. And that's why, you know, in this system, we're using the laser aligner. Um, and then the wheel alignment is set using control arm strut rods, tie rods, knuckles, the frame, and sometimes even more to obtain and maintain those proper angles. All right, but let's say a customer states their car pulls to the right. That may be. But as you can see, this is a little bit excessive uh, road crown, but it gives you the idea. The road crown is always going to fall one direction or the other. Who thinks they know? Why would a road never be dead flat? They could make them pretty flat. The technician, the line techs told me this uh, at the shop yesterday. It's because apparently when it rains, the water has to go into the drains or something like that. Exactly true. Yeah, if you think about it, we don't want standing water on the roads. Remember, I told you guys a horrible story about a car with bald tires. And I crashed it. I mean... We crown the road enough where like in a typical rain, the water will run off the side and into the drain. And if you have a multiple lane freeway, you know, you may have several, several lanes crowned one direction and several lanes crowned the other direction. Yeah. That's because I said the tires were bald. All right. You get the joke. Um, but there is going to be probably some level of crown to the road. So if the customer's concern is it pulls right, and you go drive it, if you really want to test it, you'd actually have to get the car dead center right here. You'd have to have this yellow dash line right in line with that Toyota logo. Then you'll find out if it's actually being, if it's a pull caused by the car, if it's a pull caused by the crown. Um, so I'm not saying that that's safe. And if you get a ticket, you own the ticket, you're going to pay the fine. Um, but to really test it, that would be the best way. So every car you can expect, if you take your hands off the wheel, it's likely going to drift its way to the right, assuming you're in the right lane. If you jump onto another, like on the freeway and you get in the left lane, that car may actually drift to the left because it may be crowned um, in a multiple lane highway. So just consider that. Another thing to consider, we can have um, tires that can actually have a defect inside, uh, like the belt will have shifted or um, so, you know, the tire can have a couple different issues with the, with the tread, and they call that ply steer. So ply steer can make a car pull. So if a car pulls, we don't necessarily say, oh, you need, you need an alignment. You might need alignment, but you don't know for sure. And so um, one of the things that, that uh, is covered in the chapter, if you caught it, was uh, rotating the tire. So if you, you get a car, and not a normal rotation, not just a front to rear, so that's not going to change it. But if you get a car and it pulls, one thing you could do is take the tire from the left and put it on the right or both, you know, but mostly we're worried about the front. And so you take the left front, move it to the right front, the right front to the left front. And if the pull was to the left, but now the pulls to the right, that's the tires. You don't need to even um, do the alignment check. What's kind of interesting though, is our, our really top of the line tire balancer that can do uh, that can measure this. It'll actually give you the pounds of pulling force that the tire makes. So one of them is ply steer. Uh, another one is tire conicity. And conicity, the key word is cone. So I'll show you what that looks like right here. If you look at this tire, this is kind of a ridiculous, over-exaggerated um, image. But if you look, these tires are coned like this. See, so they're worn more on the inside edge. And on this one, it's worn more on the outside edge that's going to make this car pull in this direction. All right. And so if you were to flip the tires, that would actually make the pull go the other direction. So this is a really good diagram of tires potentially causing pull. And a lot of people will only focus on the alignment, right? So tires was last week, alignments this week, but this is specifically tires relating to alignment. Um, and there's actually a way you can go through the machine where it'll measure your pounds of pull and it'll actually tell you where to put the tires. So if you had one pull into the right and one pull into the left, it'll have you put those two tires on the front and the two tires trying to pull opposite directions will cancel each, cancel each other out. And then you're good. So like in this case, 
it was pulling right. You rotated the tires, now it pulls left. Now you're troubleshooting tires. Or in this case, the car was pulling uh, right. You switch the tires. This vehicle still pulls right. Then that's when we need to we need to pursue the alignment. And that's Toyota standard operating procedure right there. Okay. And now, just a brief introduction to alignment geometry of all of all all the angles. So here's your camber. Camber, as you guys know. That's when the wheel's tilted towards the top of the fender or away from the top of the fender. Pretty common. Here's caster. Caster is a little bit more complex to explain. So I explain it like this. If you look, see that top of the strut right there and that bottom of the knuckle. The top of the strut kind of like becomes my elbow and the bottom of the knuckle becomes like my hand. So this would be positive caster. This would be zero caster. This would be negative caster back here. So that's caster. You can't really see caster from the front of the car, right? So like what I just did, if you look at my arm, you can't really tell that much what caster's doing, right? So you look at caster from the side. You look at camber from the front like this. So know the difference. And then toe, of course, and that's very difficult for me to, to show on camera, but you know, look down at your feet. And like, this would be pigeon toed, like that would be toe in, that would be toe out. This is positive toe, this is negative toe. And if you, it's kind of, it's kind of weird to think about, but if you had a car that had toe in with this one and toe out with that one, that's actually not toe. Now you just have a steering wheel that's off center because if both of your tires are going like from my perspective to the right, then all the all you're going to really have to do is steer to the left and they'll be going straight see what i'm saying and so toes kind of a funny thing um so just consider caster camber toe the first one we'll cover in a little more detail will be camber so camber is showing really well right here negative camber like i said that's hella flush uh zero camber that would be perfect straight up and down this red line right here, we can call plum. Plum would be like you take a rope or a string, you tie a rock onto it and you hold it up. That rock will be pulled right towards the center of the earth. And that angle right there is plum. So if you ever needed to check plum, you could always do that with a string. Gravity always pulls it dead center. Like if you think of what level is, you know, you guys all know if you use a level, it has a bubble, right? But if you actually think about it, you could do a plumb line and then you can make a perfect right angle and that'll always be level. So level and plumb are always perpendicular, a perfect 90 degree angle. Okay, so we're mostly worried about um, plumb. If you wanted to call it level, you could and probably people would know what you're talking about, but it's not, it's plumb. And then positive would be tilted out. So fun fact right here, if you, interest if you um uh, modify the suspension of the vehicle if you lower it it naturally falls to negative camber if you lift it it naturally goes to positive camber so when we're talking about modifying our suspension lifting lowering different springs etc uh this is going to affect our camber so as we would consider um i see that question um we talk about shoulder wear slightly different we'll get we'll get the shoulder wear and then uh positive toe for inside whereas positive camber for outward i don't know but it's a it's an interesting point negative is in but with toe positive is in i didn't make it i've never really found a good explanation for that i just know that's the fact um so we'll take a look real quick at what we call the cone effect for camber the cone effect is like basically you're looking at you're looking at um this tire is a lot of positive camber right and what that does is if you look at the if you look at the actual camber line this would be your camber line right here then you do a direct intersection of a right angle you can see that is going to point way out here and that's actually going to make it so if, if you picture that 
and um it's almost like a top you guys ever seen the 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 game where you like you spin the top and the top's kind of a cone and once it stops spinning it it just kind of goes around itself in a circle it's the same type of thing if you had camber like that it's almost like a cone you can tell it's going to try to go like this around and around and around and around so that's a good illustration as to why that causes a pull the cone the cone effect and then same with the other way if if it was cambered in that's going to try to go around itself inward so like let's say you're looking at the car from the driver's seat that's always the preferred perspective driver's seat this one's cambered outward this car is going to pull to the right. So that's why I, I showed you when I'm looking at camber things, I literally look at the numbers and I make my hands the tires. So if I've got one like this, I already know that car's pulling to the right because it's going to try to make a right circle right here. Cool. Um, and camber, again, um, will cause a couple different things like uh, that shoulder wear. That was a good question. So if we look at, um, this is still the right side. So if we look at the right side, so this would be the outside of the tire. You see how that's going to wear a lot on this inner shoulder. So your inner shoulder is going to get um, worn. Now, that's probably going to happen with more than a degree. You know, if you have 0.8 degrees of camber, that's pretty minimal. If you have under 0.5, that's great. So you need to have some pretty negative camber to get that inner edge wear. This one is showing like, I don't know, like negative 20 negative 30 degree. I don't know. That's probably actually getting fairly close to 45. That's, that's as outrageous um, a level of camber. Seen some cars like that though. I bet you have too. And that's obviously going to pull left and shred that inner uh, edge. If it was a little more realistic and let's say we put it at like a degree and a half or two, that is going to wear the inside edge, but it's going to wear the inside edge a lot slower than like, we're going to talk about toe. When I say shred, toe literally shreds the tread off, whereas camber, it's just riding on that inside edge all the time. You know it's going to wear faster. And saying this is going to be positive. So if it's a positive uh, camber, that's going to wear the outside edge and cause a pull the opposite direction. So you can um, get an idea. Now, one interesting fact, if you have camber and wider tires, that's going to cause even more apparent camber wear. So if you notice, we have we have some shoulder wear there, but because this tire is much wider, the inner edge is going to be further off the ground and more of the weight's going to be on that outer edge, let's say if we have positive right, camber. So it's even more critical when you got those wide tires to get that camber dialed in. And I'll show you a couple things I did on my Tesla that, you know, that those cars shred tires really bad. They just in the lowest setting, if it has automatic air suspension, you'll get up above, you can set the speed, but let's say 60, and it'll it'll drop to the lowest setting, and they run with like stock over two degrees of negative camber, and that inside edge just gets trashed. So in like in like 10 to 15,000 miles, those tires are shot, and for four tires on those, 2,000 bucks. I showed you. All right, so talking about rear camber, it's pretty much the same. Uh, get negative camber and positive camber the same but like with the rear it's uh, there's no steering so typically it's a little bit more simplified um, like you can see this actually has a strut but there can be a lot of different designs same type of an idea um, and then this is one way this is one way if, if you're a measurement uh, if you're a memorization type it's going to help you vehicle with camber will pull in the direction of the greatest positive camber. And if you memorize that, st that sentence, you'll remember. A vehicle with camber pull will pull in the direction of the greatest positive. So basically, the more positive the camber is, the more it pulls. I don't, like I told you, I don't memorize. I don't even try to memorize. I try to go for a thorough understanding, and that's why I visualize it, and then I make it positive. And then I say, oh, yeah, that car is going to pull to the right. See what I'm saying? So, like, this is more positive, right? That's going to pull to the right. You can remember it a couple different ways. And then uh, camber is affected by ride height. So you change the ride height, you ch change the camber. Um, and then also on earlier vehicles, we used to have um, quite a bit more larger camber angles. 
And we were, we were doing that because we were running bias applied tires and they would conform quite a bit more. And we were basically designing the suspension, suspension in a way that the camber angles would help with the center line. Um, so it's, it's, a little, it's a little bit weird to explain, but um, bias ply tires, because the tires were much more conforming, you could run camber and the tire would kind of like comply, shift, and sit pretty flat. Now you're running a radial with a steel belt. The steel belted radial, if you add camber, the tire is not going to conform and sit flat. The tire is literally going to follow the suspension and you'll have tire off the ground and tire wearing in the on the edge, right? So it, camber was less of a problem with uh, older cars with bias ply tires. And then, of course, the best would be uh, zero camber, would be maximum tire patch contact with the road. So that's why we pick on the, the hella flush cars because it's like you took a nice wide tire, you cambered it so much that this much of the tire is, is, is touching. You might as well put like bicycle tires on the car as far as traction goes. That's kind of the joke. All right now, um, let's discuss real quick cross camber. So on the alignment machine, you'll see left camber, right camber, and then in the middle, that's the cross camber. That's the difference between the left and the right. So let's say, for example, um, on this first one, we have zero camber left. We have one degree of positive camber to the right. I want to show that in my, in, in my hands. Zero degrees. Do this with me now. Positive one degree. You know that that's going to pull to the right. You can, you can already see it. You see it in my hands. This one's out. I'll make it even a little more apparent. Straight and out. Pulling to the right. Now, um, uh, example number two, one degree of negative camber and one degree of positive camber. That car is going to pull even harder to the right, really hard. All right, now number three, one degree of positive camber, one degree of positive camber. Both of them are out of spec. If you look on the machine, the left bar will be red and the right bar will be red, but the center would actually be green. Cross camber is just a comparison of the left to the right. And the cross camber is basically your indication of a pull caused by camber. So if, if they're both out of spec, but they're equal and opposite, you'll have a zero cross camber and you'll be like, definitely camber's not pulling. So it's right here. Pull cancels each other, but the tire wear still occurs. So we're adjusting individual camber to fix tire wear. We're adjusting cross camber to fix a pull. Kind of makes sense. If you gave me a car and it had, let's say, the one degree of negative camber, and I was able to get the right side to be straight up and down, I, but I couldn't get the right side to be negative one degree, right? So the best I could do is this. I'd have to go to the customer and say, hey, are you worried about tire wear? Or are you worried about a pull? And they'll say, well, I'm worried about both. And I'd say, well, Something's bent in your car, so we can't get any less than negative one degree. So you'd have to, you know, maybe take it to the align, take it to the uh, body shop and have them pull the frame. We might be able to unbolt and change parts possibly, but let's just say we couldn't. If they were to say, "Oh no, no, I really just want the car to go straight," well, cool. I'll mess the other side up to cancel it out. If all they want us to go straight, we'll do negative one and negative one, and that car will go straight. They'll wear their tires, but they were already going to wear the left tire anyway because we couldn't get it in spec. See, so that's the logic. All right. So, um, caster. Um, I actually want to want to switch this up. I meant to have. Um, I thought I had one more caster piece. No, this one's good. This one's actually correct. So, casters with the thing I was showing you. And. What I want you to keep in mind is this, this steering axis right here. So that steering axis is, that has to do with um, the upper point and the lower point of the steering axis. So like it, a bicycle is a good example. I remember that's why I put this one first. So the handlebars go through the fork. And then, so the upper would be right here like the handlebar basically. The lower would actually be the wheel. So if you were to put a point on the upper and put a point on the lower and draw a line, which we did, it's red, 
and then hang a plumb bob and measure the angle difference, that's your caster. So you guys can see this, right? This is your plumb bob, and this is your upper to your lower steering axis. That is caster right there, the difference between those two. And this bicycle, for example, that's positive caster. Cool, right there. Now, the one that I always, I always joke around about would be the uh, Orange County choppers or something. You guys have seen that before? You know what I'm even talking about? Well, let, me, let me pull one up for you. Let's see here. Yeah, you could say goofy bikes. You know, it's not Orange County, California. It's Orange County, New York. So just FYI. Uh, let's go with images. All right, just look at the rake on that thing. And they got and they got ones way more raked out than that. So we got to find something real. Like, look at that. Just look at that. You see the forks right here. That thing is raked out. That's extremely, extremely uh, positive caster right there. So back to the presentation, I'll tell you why that's important to you. When you have a lot of positive caster, see, should be able to see that now. When you have a lot of positive caster, uh, that's going to increase your high speed stability. Basically, that tire is so far out in front, it's going to actually have a lot of what we call this caster trail between the, the, the steering axis line, the caster line, and the actual point of contact. The, the, the further out it is, the more stable it's going to be. So like a bicycle, you know, if, if with some practice, you can take your hands off the bike and you can, you can pedal with no hands. So cool. It's pretty amazing. Really good for impressing potential spouse, I think. But uh, that's the reason that you're able to do that is because it has a lot of positive caster. Now, if you had a bike where we tucked that tire back right under you, yeah, give that a shot. That thing is going to be like all over the place. So your caster really affects how the vehicle feels. Now, especially in a car, we're going to transfer from the bike because that's easy to understand. And we're going to jump over to like the actual vehicle. If you're looking at, let's say, lower ball joint, and in this one, it may be like stop top of the strut. That's going to be your caster angle. If you had it pretty positive, that vehicle, it's kind of going to be like the bike you can ride with no hands. You could let go of the steering wheel, and, and that steering wheel is going to want to stay centered. Boom. But as you start to get it to be closer to negative, that's when the steering wheel is going to get easier to turn. So like for me, I like positive caster um, on, on, in most cases. It makes it. It feels like you're trying to steer out of a hole. So if you're if you're turning your steering wheel, it's like you got to put some force into steering, and then if you let go of it, wham! It kind of whips right back to center. That's a good setup for for like the canyons. Um, but it's it's harder. It's more effort. You know, it takes some muscle to steer a car with a bunch of positive caster. So the power steering pump may not be happy. The customer may concern be complaining. So that's why we usually keep caster in spec. The vehicle's designed for a certain amount of caster. Um, but, but the other way can, can bring other problems, like I was saying about the shimmy. If your caster is too negative, now it's going to be easy to steer. But think about that. It's going to be easy to steer. It's going to be so easy to steer. It's going to be more prone to like any inconsistencies in the road or the tires. It's going to be easier to move your steering wheel. It goes both ways. Makes sense. So they feel different. They perform different. They have no effect on tire wear. So if you're if you have a vehicle and your upsells for an alignment because of tire wear, we're not worried about caster. They can cause a pull though. So everything that I was saying about the caster, let's go back to this, right? Let's make my the rights really positive. Let's say actually, because it's easier to see my left arm. Let's say the right's got one degree positive and the left has three degrees positive. You can see already if these are handlebars, I'm pulling this way. I'm pulling to the right. So a difference in caster will cause a pull, but it will not wear the tire. All the tire's doing is it's being set further forward or further back. It's not the angle of the tire. Make sense? So it's kind of interesting, but there's a little bit more to caster and this is what i was starting to tell you is when we start to steer the vehicle 
um, the caster has an effect on what we call spindle arc right here. So this the spindle, when we turn, it's kind of weird. I'm going to try to show it to you. This is your spindle. See, it's pretty level. When we turn, the spindle arc kind of goes down both directions. It kind of goes down. So when you turn off a of center, it's pushing down on the road, which brings the height up. What's really interesting is if you were to look at a car and you were to measure from the floor to the fender and then turn the wheel, the fender actually gets a little higher. The car is at its lowest when it's dead straight ahead. Spindle arc is the reason for that. Spindle arc is on purpose. Um, the, that's the reason that the caster centers the wheel. So if you have a lot of caster, that further exaggerates your spindle arc. When you steer, it's going to lift the fender more, but the fender wants to come back down. So the fender, the weight of the vehicle is trying to push down, and that's trying to center your steering wheel. So that's the reason that more caster is going to give you a little more like self-centering on the steering wheel. It's going to snap back a little quicker, and that's the reason why. Now, I saw that question in the chat. I anticipated that question in the chat. So here you go. So caster pulls negative. So what I was showing you with my arms, I think it's actually a little bit easier to see right here in the screen. So if you have this caster is more positive right here, and this caster is a little less positive, you make your steering wheel, you make your handlebars like this. Look at the right one. The right one's out further, right? So now look at your handlebars. You're pulling to the left. Cool. So so like th this has actual numbers. You have four degrees of caster on the right and two degrees on the left. So you, you could actually, you know, this is what I would do. When I take the ASC, I pass. And I may look like an idiot, but guess what? I pass. So who's the real idiot? All right. So here you go, right? Four, it's like up here. Four is up here. Two is a little bit up. It's hard for you to see from that angle. So four is up here. Two is only a little bit. You could do it yourself. Make sure you understand it. Now, if you don't like that in your, you know, I, we're all a little bit different, okay? So I'll, I'll beyond respect you. I want to understand it, so I'm doing the thing with my hands. But if you just want to memorize it, just remember this. Caster pulls negative. Make sense? So whichever side has less caster, it's pulling to that side. Cool. Um, and now we, we, what we were just discussing was, um, you know, caster, the difference between left and right. Well, there's a term for that. It's called cross caster. That's kind of like cross camber, isn't it? <laughs> all right. Because that's all it is. Look, caster 3.7 left side, right side 3.7. What's the difference? Nothing. So this has zero cross caster. That's amazing. Perfect. That car is not going to pull at least not due to caster. Now, camber, that's a different story. Camber, negative 0.4 on the left. On the right, positive 0.1. So that's like, eh, I'm like, eh. That car is going to pull to the right based on camber. But actually, it may not because it's actually in spec. Half a degree of camber is pretty normal, most vehicles. I've seen some vehicles a little like down to 0.3, they only want they, they only want to allow about 0.3 different side to side, but most would allow up to, up to about a half a degree. Um, and so again, caster, not a, not a tire wearing angle, not a tire wearing angle, but it can cause a pull. Cool. Um, it, and oh, and another note on caster, I explained this in person, but I'm gonna explain it again. Caster is a, is, a, is a calculated angle when you turn and turn. So you have to do a caster sweep. It means you got to turn the wheel to the right and turn the wheel to the left. And basically, it's measuring the spindle arc. It's measuring how it changes when you turn, and that tells you how raked out it is. And exactly the details don't matter to you, but the detail that has to matter is it's not live. So you do a caster sweep. And then you're like, oh, let me change the caster real quick. And then you're like, yeah, it's good now. You don't know that. You have no idea what the caster is. The computer predicted what the caster became. It, the, the alignment machine does not know. So that's when you'd, again, you go over here, actually on screen, 
and you would go to this one right here, and that is verify or measure caster, and you'd sweep it again. Turn all the way this way, turn all the way this way, turn in the center, press ready, and then boom, that number's accurate. And if it's good, then you're done. And if it's bad, then measure it, but then you got to sweep it again and again. You got to sweep it as many, many times as you adjust it, you got to sweep it again. Well, camber is not that way. A caster is that way. And that's why we kind of get into the spindle arc. It's got to actually look at that arc when we're doing the, the uh, alignment check. All right, now continuing. Ride height and the influence on caster. So if we go ahead and uh, actually let me, let, me, let me back up because I see a good question in the chat. More positive caster means the wheel is closer to the fender compared to the other side. So more positive, remember if, if this is the front of the car, that's gonna be raked out. You can actually see positive caster will have the wheel towards the front bumper. Less positive caster will bring it back to like the fender near the door, right in there. But there's one more thing that, um, that we're gonna add into this and it's called setback. So um, hold that thought most. Right, so we're just covering the basic alignment angles right now, and then we're going to throw some stuff in there and be like, what the heck? Okay, just normal. So uh, if we change ride height, that's actually going to affect our caster as well. So if you raise it, that is going to make our caster more positive. And if you lower it, that's going to make our caster more negative. So changing the ride height affects caster and camber. Right, If you raise it, camber's out, and you lower it, camber's in. So you, you start changing the ride height, it's all messed up. And that's actually one of the reasons that um, I'm gonna show you, before we do an alignment, we need to do alignment pre-inspection, which includes checking the ride height. And if the ride height is not good, we fix that first. You don't do an alignment and then do the ride height because the ride height messes up your alignment. Make sense? Cool, and then here's toe. So um, toe is, Toe is the final adjustment and probably the most critical. Toe can really wear tires very, very rapidly if the toe is messed up. Um, but a little bit more to know. So like toe in is positive, like I was saying, toe in. That would mean basically you're pigeon toed. So if you're looking, if you stand and your toes are pointing each other, that's, that's pigeon toed. I didn't come up with the term. I'm sorry if it's offensive. It is what it is. Straight ahead would be great. A little bit of toe-in does give you something interesting, though. Toe-in will help the car track really nice and straight. So sometimes, especially on like higher-end cars, and the specs, they'll call for a little positive toe. A lot of times, to be honest, when we're doing the alignment, we're just making sure we get the, the little arrow in the center of the bar. But, you know, the specs are designed by the engineers and and, uh, you know, on a high-end car, they want the car to track straight. Some people, let's say that they were looking at a Lexus, they'll think the Lexus is built better because they take their hand off the steering wheel and it goes straight. They'll be like, oh, this car's built so good. And it is. But I don't know that it's built any better than a Camry. They just may set a little bit of positive toe in there so that way it tracks really straight. So that's, a, that's kind of a trick. Um, the negative is that's going to cause more quick tire wear. So a person who buys a Camry wants their tires to last a long time. The person who buys a high-end Lexus, they want their tires to last, but they definitely need it to go straight. So we may set it with a little bit of toe in. Not too much, but just a little. All right. And then zero toe and then toe out would obviously be different. Now, toe out's kind of interesting. Um, both toe in, if it's severe, will we'll wear the tires. Toe in will wear the outside edges. Toe out will wear the inside edges. We'll come back to that. But um, Toe out's kind of interesting. The car won't track straight. It won't track as straight. It's jittery. It's like, it's very responsive. It, when you're toe in, that car pretty much wants to go straight. And when you turn it, it's like, fine, I'll go. But I'm pretty much like, they're fighting each other. Now, when you're a little toe out, it's like each tire is ready to go its own direction, right? So it's a lot more, it's kind of darty. It darts is the way I would say. Um, so it depends on, on what you want. If you're, if you're more, uh, if you're doing autocross, you may actually want maybe even a little toe out back. Um, and then if you look at, if you look at this from the top, there's something you have to understand. Um, we can, 
as professional technicians and trained ones working at a shop, we can get kind of lazy, to be honest. We can shoot the car up on the alignment machine and the alignment machine tells us what we got. It tells us what to do. If you click tools, it'll actually tell you what size the wrenches are under tools and kits. I mean, really, it can basically have you doing pretty good alignments and you could be a total moron, just saying. So I wanna take a step back and I wanna say, you could actually set toe with like a tape measure. What you'd actually do, you'd go to the front of the tire, you'd measure from, pick a, pick a spot on the tread, maybe dead center, right? And you'd measure middle of the tread to middle of the tread. Let's say you get 71 and a half inches. Then you'd go to the back side of the tire, center of the tread to, seven, to center of the tread, you get 73 inches. The difference there is an inch and a half. So they would actually call that like 1.5 toe, positive 1.5. It's just the way it is. It's, it's, uh, it's just a difference between the two. You could do it with an actual tape measure. And so it's kind of funny, but um, if you understand it in that way, it's at least going to help you when you're looking at the tire wear. Um, even if you're going to like, let's say you do a whole bunch of suspension work, you can get it kind of roughly set up before you go tie up the alignment rack. You could literally string a tape measure across there. I've even seen people, this is kind of a joke, do an alignment with just a shoestring and some bubble gum. You know, that's a joke. Oh, I'm such a good mechanic. I could align that car with nothing but shoestring and some bubble gum. Okay. You take a little string. It has to be a long string. It's got to go eight feet across the car, something like that, seven probably. And you take a piece of gum and you put the gum right here and stick the string to it and pull it across and see where it lands and then make a mark and bring it to the back and stick some gum here and pull it across. You got to make it the same front to back with your shoe string and your bubble gum. I've heard all the stories. The same people tell those stories, tell me they walked up to school in the snow, both ways, uphill, both ways, barefoot, both ways. They had it so hard. You know, what do you do? Now, if you look at toe out, Kind of a similar type of an idea it would be the front measurement would be more than the rear measurement and now how do we adjust that well there's adjusting sleeves and we're going to get in all the adjustments later we're also going to take a look at the tire wear so your questions have been very on point right right in here in the chat it looks like one or two slides ahead of me so if this is toe in wear you can see it's basically it's it's towed in what that's going to do is this tire is trying to go this way. See how it's, it's trying to steer inward, but it's being forced to go straight. So you're essentially dragging that tire across the ground. So if it's toe in, it's going to mostly wear the outside shoulders, but it's not going to be smooth, clean camber wear. It's going to be probably smooth in one direction. And then coming back, it's going to be you're going to feel it. If you had a glove on, you're going to feel it grab the glove, right? So it's almost, it's kind of heel toe wear, but it's specifically on the outside edges for toe in. And if you had toe out, it's going to be the same, but it's going to be on the inside edge. It's going to be heel toe, choppy, but on the inside edge. So that's going to tell you uh, what to anticipate, you know? So if you're looking at it, you think, oh yeah, that, that toe wear is probably going to be um, positive toe. Then you put on the alignment machine and it says, yeah, you got positive toe. You're like, all right, I got it. But if you put on the alignment machine and then it shows normal, then you might have to do a little more investigation. Um, and and uh, we're actually going to cover that. So let's just say it's got toe type wear, but your alignment check shows it's good. Well, what do you do? I'll show you something. So now individual and total toe, because I'm going to back up just a bit boom, 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 right here. Here's your toe, right? Um, toe is zero, zero right is zero, zero, but then you have this thing in the middle. That's not called cross toe. I kind of wish it was called cross toe, but it's cross camber, it's cross caster, but for toe, it's called total toe. The difference right here that we were doing, the difference between the front and the rear, that's the total toe number, okay? So here, when we're talking about total toe, that's just basically left toe plus right toe. So if we had uh, one and one, that would be uh, 
a two. That would be two degrees. So this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Sometimes toe is measured in inches. So we have a difference of 1.5 inches. That would be 1.5 inches of toe. That's that's a, like that's outrageous, by the way. That's crazy. But other times toe is measured in degrees. So if you had dead center, that's zero. If you had uh, toe out, that'd be one degree. That'd be that'd be negative one degree. Or if you had like a bunch of more toe in, that would be like positive two degrees. So you can measure toe in inches, which is a difference, which is a measurement of front and rear, so that's total toe. Or you can measure it in degrees, which is more of a measurement of like which, you know, if you're looking at dead center, how many degrees is the angle off of dead center? It could be either way, okay? It's a little weird. Kind of doesn't matter, but at least the theory, I want you to understand it. So individual toe is left plus, left plus right. All right, now let's get into it a little bit more. So if we have um, a vehicle and let's say we're doing a four-wheel alignment, we're, we're actually aligning the front tires to the rear tires. So what I was saying about the total toe, that's like the front tires, the front of the front tire compared to the rear of the front tire. But a lot of times we're doing a more in-depth alignment. So we're actually looking at the rear tires and going to align the front tires to the rear tires. So if I jump back one more, assuming that the rear tires are set ahead, we actually want it right on this dead ahead number. But the alignment machine picks up on this, and it actually looks at the rear tires first and essentially says, you know what? We're essentially going to look at our total toe number, but we're also going to reference the rear toe so that we can align it to the rear. Kind of funny. Um, and then essentially, if you have a car that's dead straight, everything should be just zero. But here's the reality. I want to show you the geometric center line. If it's a Toyota, you're literally going to take that Toyota logo, this one right here, and you're going to split it dead center, dissect that sucker right in the middle. And pull a line like a string from the rear logo all the way up to the front logo, and then pull it off and into infinity. That's your geometric center line. That's actually the body of the car center line. That is a little bit different than what our actual rear tires are doing. So if you look right here, this tire is towed in. You can see how these rear tires are towed in. So if these rear tires are towed in, but let's say it's towed in like a half a degree and a half a degree, that would maintain the same, that'd be the same as the center line. The problem comes when you got tires that are different, right? If you got a half a degree here and a whole degree here, now your rear tires are no longer in line with your geometric center line. You're like, what the heck? And the alignment machine actually makes it uh, fairly easy, but just, just talking about it when it measures toe, it's, it's talking about the difference of the geometric center line when it shows the degrees. It's crazy. So let's continue with that. This one is a little more positive toe in the rear and a little less positive toe on the right side in the rear. So if you look at this, this we're going to basically take the toe of the left and the toe of the right, and we're going to essentially average the two. So if we had two degrees positive and one degree positive, the average would be one and a half, right? We would take the geometric center line, we do one and a half degrees, and this becomes a thrust line. What are you serious? What are you talking about? Well, the reason we need to know that is because basically that's the direction that the vehicle is trying to go. And it's all based on the rear. So Ideally, we can use the real center line, but in reality, we look at the rear two tires, we calculate the difference between the two, we average them, and then we pull this geometric center line in blue. That's the direction the rear of the car is trying to go. Now, when we do that, and we do toe in the front, we're actually calculating the center line. It's basically, 
when you run when you run wind tow on the machine, and even if you just do regular tow too, but especially with wind tow, it's calculating where should these tires be pointing to get the car to go straight and to get the steering wheel to be straight ahead. So here's what's kind of crazy. Here we got a vehicle with a thrust angle to the left. It's a negative thrust angle. If you think about it, what's going to happen, the rear of the car is going to try to go left. Right? So you're thinking, well, that's kind of weird. If the rear of the car is going to try to go left, you think maybe you'd have to steer right. But if the rear of the car is going left and you're steering right, it's taking a hard right. So to actually get it to go straight, you have to steer the same direction left. Oh my gosh, what are you talking about? Well, um, it's just the way it is. So now if your rear wheels are going this way and you make your front wheels go the same direction, it would seem like you're going to go left, but in reality, the whole car is going to be shifted off center and you're going to be going down the road kind of crooked, but it's going to be straight. Now we got a term for that round here. It's called dog tracking. Dog tracking. I remember we'd go, we'd go, um, our last dog, we walk our dog and she, it was kind of funny when you'd be behind her, you'd kind of see like her rear legs over here and I'd be looking and you'd see her front legs kind of over here. So you'd see the rear legs to the right and the front legs to the left, but you could see all four legs from behind. You're like, what the heck is up with that? Well, that's dog tracking and dogs typically kind of do that, especially if you look at their tracks on the ground, they're not in a perfect, perfect straight line. That would actually have to do with like spine alignment. So if your if your rear if your rear tires are going a little off, you're gonna match the front tires to it, but the whole car is gonna be going down the road a little sideways. You could call it crab walking, but a lot of times we'll call it dog tracking. So I have a video on YouTube. I believe I assigned it. If I didn't, I'll, I'll shoot it to you guys. But it's a Tacoma going down the freeway, all sorts of dog tracking, dog tracking like crazy. And what is the cause for the dog tracking? What do you think? The cause of the dog tracking is this thing we're talking about. That's the thrust angle. Thrust angle causes dog tracking. A thrust angle, it's kind of interesting because to get the car, nor naturally what the customer does, they get the car to go straight. You got the thrust angle to the left. To get the car to go straight, they go to the left. They have no idea their, car, their whole car is going down the road crooked. They just say, yeah, to go straight, I have to go left. So they request, you know, an alignment and you can, you can do an alignment. Um, basically what we're going to do is let's, let's say first we would like to fix the rear toe. If we can fix the rear toe, that'll, that'll resolve the thrust angle. Cool. That'd be, that'd be the ideal, but let's say it's a FJ cruiser. It's got a solid axle. There's nothing adjustable back there. In fact, you put it on the machine and it's all gray. Tacoma, Forerunner, Tundra, all Lexus GX460, all going to be gray because it's non-adjustable. So if we can't fix the thrust angle in the back, we can't fix the toe in the back. All we can really do is, is align the front tires to match the rear tires. Now, if we align the front tires to match the rear tires and we do that while we're on the light machine, we set the steering wheel center, lock it or don't lock it, or at least run wind tow, adjust the tires. Now, boom, steering wheel center, customer's happy. Technically, that car's dog tracking. Technically, that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be on the geometric center line, but it's not, and that's fine. This happens all the time. We don't need to make a big urgent emergency. We just, we just basically use the alignment machine to set the toe and it's going to calculate for all that. Cool. Now let's say it has a positive thrust angle. Now you see both rear tires are pointed to the right. That means you're going to steer the car to the right to get it to go straight. What the heck? Now, Madi's question is good. Um, and this is going to show you that angle again. So again, a one degree thrust angle would be the geometric center line and the thrust angle are at a one degree angle. So this is nowhere near one, by the way. One would be like way tight. It'd be much tighter. Now, how or why? Um, a lot of times uh, vehicles don't have a thrust angle from the factory, but they can. 
there's been a number of vehicles that from the factory have a little bit of a thrust angle and you know it'd be pretty small but if it's got a larger thrust angle it's very possible it's something that was in a, in an accident and that doesn't mean the whole body's twisted although it could be could be a bent frame anything that basically let's go to the truck solid rear axle anything that gets that axle twisted now it has a thrust angle so let's say um customer throws it in reverse they go to back up and there's a big curb behind them and boom they slam the curb and it actually tweaks the axle now it's got a thrust angle now it's going to have a crooked steering wheel or more likely what i've seen from students over the years there they are out there doing the what you call the skirt skirt out there drifting not like not like the clothing like more like you know the wheels are are, are squeaking squeaking their tires and uh they slide their bmw into a curb i got a picture of this one slide it into the curb depending on how they hit the curb they may they may they, this is actually where we get into some other angles but they're going to move the position of that tire so now if you've got a tire the left side is straight the right side they slid it into a curb and now the right side is like way way negative on average, it just pulled the, the thrust angle to the right. So probably probably due to an accident, more than likely, some sort of damage. Um, I've also seen on some vehicles, I had a car that pulled, that had a steering wheel off center to the right. It didn't pull, sorry. Steering wheel off center to the right, and then I would drive it, and then the steering would be off center to the left, and it was all over the place. I pulled it on the alignment machine. We went ahead and we adjusted the rear toe, hooked it all up. I went and drove it. And then it was still off center. So I pulled it back in and all the alignment angles were pointing way left. So I centered them all and I went on a couple little road tests. And then all of a sudden I pulled it back in the art machine and now they're all right. It's like, what the heck? Well, that one was actually due to uh, bad bushings. The bushings were allowing the whole rear suspension axle to, to move. So you'd go around a hard turn, it would actually move it enough and then it would get stuck. And then you go around the other turn, it would move it the other way, and then it would get stuck. So, like, you may consider some bushings and stuff here, too, um, but, but a defect. Now, remember we talked about that car that had, that had tow wear? The car had tow wear, but you checked the alignment and the tow was good. Check this out. I'm going to teach you about the toot. Toot is toot, toe out on turns. This one's kind of hard to explain, but, but basically when you want to go around a turn, there's this thing that's called Ackerman geometry. You're going to take the two rear tires, draw a line through them. Boom. Then you're going to take each one of the front tires and you're going to, you're going to do a perfect right angle, right? A, um, uh, what the heck is a right angle called? Whatever. A perfect, 90 degree, perfect right angle, perpendicular. Thank you. So perpendicular, right out, and the same with the left. If these had the exact same angles, this one would come to this point, and this one would be way further out. See, So we want our tires going straight when you're going straight. But when we turn, we actually want this one to turn uh, a little bit different than this one. Like, for example, this left tire has more toe out. If it had no toe out, that line would not be coming to the same point. We want all of our angles to intersect at this point, and that's the Ackerman principle. So rear tires over, front tires, front tires, and they should all come to the same point all together. That's by design. And that's controlled by something that we call the steering arm. And so your steering knuckle has a little arm built into it that the tie rod attaches to, the tie rod end, boom. That steering arm is, is actually shaped in a way where when you turn, it's gonna cause toe out, toe out on turn. So the, if you're going left, the inside tire is gonna turn a little extra and the outside tire is gonna turn a little slower because of the arc on that steering arm. But let's just say that you slid it into another curb and this would be a front tire and you bent that steering arm. Well, you could pull the car in 
the, the toe is off, right? You could adjust the toe and now the toe's on. But the problem is the toe's dead center right now because you've made up for a bent steering arm. But when you go around a turn, it's not doing this toot thing that it's supposed to do. It's not doing the toe out on turns correctly because it's bent. So you got one tire, let's say your let's say your right tire is going right to the right point and your left tire, because it's bent, is trying to come way out here, you're going to essentially scrub that tire. You're going to be scrubbing that tire every time you turn. It's going to be just like you have a toe problem, except the machine says your toe is good. So how do you diagnose this one? And the answer is toe out on turns. So if you get into the machine, you can actually measure toe out on turns. We'll cover this one more time. The toe out on turns would give you that mysterious tire wear <clears throat> that looks like toe, but your toe's in spec. Doesn't mean your toe out on turns is. Toe out on turns is a special one. You actually have to go in the machine and do some different movements. All right, so, um, and this is just summarizing what I said. So here's another way to look at toe out on turns. If you look at your steering arm, that's this arm right here. We would draw a line on that steering arm, and that should hit dead center of the geometric center line exactly when it's about to cross the rear axle. So when they design the car, they design it like this. When we're actually measuring on the alignment machine, they, they're more measuring this. Right, so those should all be the same. It's in perfect symmetry. It actually makes a lot of sense. All that, of course, would affect your turning radius because again when you're doing a turn this is this is the radius of your turn is like to do a u-turn how far would you have to go it's essentially like half of the diameter um and then when you're we're doing these tight turns remember that's when we need to toe out on turns assuming it's going to work right so and the point here is when we do steer a lot of times there's a steering stop. So we can only bring the tires so far. We don't let the tires like keep going and going and going and going. It's gonna hit a turn stop. On most cars that's inside the steering rack. On some older cars that was actually the knuckle would hit the control arm. There'd be a little point right there that would be shiny silver and it would squeak when you hit it. So we'd put a little grease on there and it would no longer squeak. But that's a turning stop. Uh, not to be, con they may call it a bump stop, but I wouldn't call it a bump stop. I call it a turn stop. All right. And then continuing, this gets into the thrust angle, center lines, and setback. So the thrust angles, like what we talked about, it can be adjusted if it has adjustable rear suspension. But if it's got a, a solid axle, it can't be. So I'll give you a really cool example. We had uh, in the dealer, we had a big 2500 HD, and it was in a collision. And the body shop did all sorts of work on it. And then, the, you know, it was, it was a good body shop was attached to the dealership. It was a good place. So they send the car from the body shop to the tech shop and they put it on the alignment machine. And it's got this wild, nasty thrust angle in the back. And it's a truck. So there's no adjustment. You get to looking at it. And immediately the, uh, my mentor at the time or, already knew what was wrong. Boom, it's done. Because he knew the suspension system. So your axle, your rear axle, sits on the leaf springs. The leaf springs locate the axle. Little did you know, there's a little tab on the bottom of the axle and a pocket. There's a tab on the bottom of the leaf spring and a pocket on the axle. And when this got in an accident, it actually sheared the tab off. It sheared the little dowel. When it sheared the dowel, now the axle is sitting off-centered. So the axle is at an angle in the leaf spring. And that was the whole issue. So what the truck need? It actually need a leaf spring because that's the dowel was what was broken off. Basically, the dowel is a bolt that holds all the springs and the spring pack together. And it just has a special end on it to locate it. So um, that one is kind of funny where they say, you know, you can't adjust thrust angle on rear suspension. That's true. But that doesn't mean you can't fix the defect that's causing it. So you might have to think a little bit on those. Right, and then um, this gets into, um, well, 
some other things. So like what I was saying right here, the leaf spring that had a broken center bolt. I wanted to tell you that story before I showed you. And then a couple of uh, interesting points. A small thrust angle can be compensated by adjusting the front wheels. We do that all the time. That's normal. The thrust line should be minimal. It should be very, very close to the geometric center line, as close as possible. And then setback is interesting. Setback's an alignment angle, but it's not adjustable. So why do we care about it? Well, it allows the technician to diagnose the vehicle. So we would use setback as a diagnostic tool. And then to measure it, we put on the alignment machine. And, and the alignment machines can actually measure setback, but let's just say we're going to measure it manually. Setback is basically a wheel-based measurement. If you're going to go dead center of the wheel, like the hub, to dead center of the hub, you get a measurement. And let's just say we got, um, I don't know, 100 inches. And then you went over to the left side and you got 98 inches. What's that tell you? What's the difference? And the setback would be two inches. You'd have to find the spec, right? But if the setback is two inches, that's going to tell you that this left front tire is set back. It's pushed rearward two inches. Technically, it could be actually the rear one pushed forward, but there's a difference in the in the wheelbase from left to right. That's what's that's what setback is. Now, if it has setback, well, the wheelbase well, the wheelbase measurements typically shorter than the other. True, it can be incorrect due to damage from a collision, or let's say a cradle or subframe. So if we do uh, a big job and we put the subframe up, we're going to be really careful to look at the marks and we're going to try to bolt up the marks where they're supposed to be. Um, Madi, that's a good question. The setback could potentially be fixed by caster, yes. So we're going to get there. Um, and also, if you're in an accident, it may actually shift the cradle. It can cause a pull. Dog tracking or crab walking can cause some uh, tire wear as well. right? So if you look at it, this is a good illustration of setback on the alignment machine. We've got the left the left side is set back, and they don't measure it in inches. They'll actually measure it in degrees. So we got a negative 0.17 degree setback. So that's telling you, hey, something's up with this. At that point, um, at that point, we'd have to make, um, we'd have to really look at it to try to figure out what's going on. If it was a front wheel drive with a subframe, and yes, cradle is subframe. Subframe is when it's not a full body on frame, but it's like a powertrain frame in the front, right? Four or five or six bolts probably, boom, carries the engine transmission. That's the subframe. We got one, they call it a cradle alignment. It's one of the last slides. But if we have, let's say, a car that got smacked, it could bend a control arm, it could bend a, a strut, but it could also shift the subframe. In which case, we're trying to figure out what the heck we're gonna do and I have a video one, it just went really long. It turned into a nightmare, but I'll see if I can take the time to stitch it together. It's actually on my own Tesla. Um, that had, it was actually not setback though, it was actually camber, but it had negative camber on one side and positive on the other, and it was maxed out. So for whatever reason, I don't know, it's when they assembled it or something, the subframe was never centered. So if your subframe is shifted, like, like like this, that could mess with your setback. If your subframe is shifted like this, that would affect your camber if you think about it, right? So just using these tools to do the diagnosis is gonna be very helpful. And that's the main reason that we look at these. Now, this is where it gets a little more in depth. So, um, and, and at this point I'd like to specify, on the ASC, it's mostly going to be caster camber toe, what causes tire wear, what causes pull. If we give you a bunch of a, an actual measurement, you tell me which way does it pull, what you'd fix it, right? So when we get here into as setback, um, and a thrust angle might be minimal part of it, but SAI, very minimal. A lot of these are advanced alignment angles. Um, they're good for you to know. They're good for you to fix cars. You're probably not going to see them on the AOC, but 
if your whole goal is to be just like, you know, I, I, I can align a car, you don't need to know this. If your goal is to be able to align a car and pass ASC, you maybe need to know a little bit. I wouldn't be impressed. But if you really want to know the heck you're doing, you do need to understand this stuff. Car comes in with bent parts. Car comes in with problems. That's why I told you guys, my if I get a car, it's messed up. I can get the alignment on point. I can get the car to go dead straight. People are shocked because they've had it aligned 10 times and it never went straight. But I'm going to go way deep into these advanced alignment angles. All right, so we'll, we'll go over it, and then we're going to summarize them one more time at the end of the class, okay? So do your best to understand. SAI is what we call steering axis inclination. So if you look at your lower ball joint and your upper ball joint, and you draw a line between the two, that is your steering axis if you're looking at it from the front. Now, let me make caster again. You remember, caster, you're looking at me from the side, right? This is caster. Now, I'm going to make a steering axis and a caster. You can see my caster, but now you can actually see my steering axis. See, it's out this way. You couldn't really see that when I was over here. You can only see caster. This is caster. And this is your steering axis. Now, that's not the same as camber. Camber is the tire. Camber is basically uh, an extension of the hub right here. This is camber. Your SAI is, is actually upper steering point to lower steering point. In this case, that's ball joints. Upper ball joint, lower ball joint. In a McPherson strut, that would be a lower ball joint and an upper strut mount on top of the strut because there is no upper ball joint. Okay, but that's your SAI, steering axis inclination. Steering axis inclination is uh, a lot like caster. It can affect quite a few things. It, it, the effect of SAI is to make the end of the stub axle or spindle move downward. So that has, again, to do with really a spindle arc. It brings the pivot point close to the center of the tire contact patch. So that one's going to get tricky. We're talking about this. The pivot point should be close to the patch of the, to the contact patch. I'm going to come up with that. That's going to be some other than SAI. But um, steering purposes, SAI ideally intersects with the camber line. So if we want a perfect suspension, SAI should be very close, if not hitting ideally, right where the center line is. So that's all designed. Um, any difference can um, cause something called scrub radius. Okay, so pause on the scrub radius because I'm going to come back to that. Now, SAI again, we're, we're talking about, you're looking at the front. Here's the tire. The SAI is the inner, is the uh, upper, and, upper and lower ball joint. And that right there is our SAI. And then this is our vertical. Now I'm going to add a term, and then we're going to come back to it. All right, right here, you've got your SAI at, let's say, three degrees. And then right here, you've got your camber at, let's say, one degree. What's three plus one? That'd be four. Four is your included angle. I'm like, what the heck? Who cares about included angle? Well, the reason we show the included angle is because if you're trying to do diagnosis and you can obtain the SAI and the included angle, which will also use camber, but we're, we already knew camber by the time we got to this point, you can generally determine what part is bent. Okay, and that's as much detail as I'll give you. But in the final unit of the class, we I'm going to show I'm going to give you access to a chart. Um, that's going to help you diagnose what part is bent. So a car rolls into the alignment rack. We go ahead and we do an alignment. It's got some issues. You know, it's got it's got a caster and camber problems. And you know something's bent, but you don't know what's bent. This is where you can get into SAI and included angle and then do a couple extra sweeps and a couple extra clicks of the mouse. And then you can obtain SAI and included angle and then plug it into this chart and it'll tell you strut, control arm, subframe, et cetera. Okay, so that's, that's like, if you can do that, 
that's how you really know what you're doing. But I'm going to tell you, mo nine out of 10 techs, or maybe more, maybe over like 95 out of 100, no idea, just way over the head. Um, and then if you really, if this is your type of personality where you want to be good at this, you want to be good at that, you want to be good at that, next thing you know, you're going to be able to fix the cars that other people can't fix. And that's when you get some kind of cool opportunities. So consider that. Now, just a brief one on the included angle. If you look, you can see here's the ball joints, right? So this right here is our steering axis inclination. That's our steering axis SAI. And then right here is our actual camber. And right here is our vertical line. So right here we have like kind of a normal SAI, but we have a really big included angle. And that's kind of telling us, you know, something about where these joints are sitting. And that's how it does the diagnosis. Kind of crazy. Now, we're right here at SAI. So if you understand SAI pretty good, hopefully you do. We're looking at the axis of inclination from the front of the car. We can get into scrub radius. SAI intersecting the tire center line. It's basically camber. So if basically, if you look at these two, where they're going to intersect is going to be positive or negative. If they intersect below the, below the road surface, that's a positive scrub radius. If they intersect above the road surface, that's a negative scrub radius. And that affects how the vehicle handles. Um, like for example, let's say you go ahead and you change the size of the wheels and tires. That's gonna affect your scrub radius, right? Right here, you had a positive scrub radius. It drove like it had a positive scrub radius. It felt, now that's not to say a positive scrub radius is better. It's just when the car is manufactured, they come up with a scrub radius and that's how it's supposed to handle. Then you go ahead and you put some 24s on it, 26s on it. And now all of a sudden your wheel and tire is so much larger your scrub radius has now shifted. It still hits the same spot. You didn't change the suspension, right? But it used to be below the road surface and now it's way above the road surface because you got a giant 26 on there. That's when you would change how the vehicle handles. So if somebody comes into the shop, let's say you're all working Toyota Lexus dealers and they say, oh, my vehicle doesn't handle right. And you look out there and they got big old fuel wheels or or, or methods or whatever, and 35s, have a nice day. It's not going to handle the way it was designed. They changed the scrub radius. Even though they didn't touch the suspension, they changed the scrub radius as soon as they went to larger tires. The, Tacoma don't come with no 35. Tacoma, Tacoma come with like a 31, or maybe less, you know, like a, like a 285, 75R16 or something. That's something just to know, not to go be like, oh, yeah, well, let me check your scrub radius, but just understanding the concept of tire and wheel will change it, okay? Now, this gets into a little bit, um, you know, of, of how the scrub radius affects. You got a positive scrub radius. If it's too far positive, it'll be darty, especially like when you apply the brakes, it, it moves around. You got too much negative scrub radius, the vehicle can become unstable. So... They're both darty and unstable, but it's not to say like caster for me. I like positive caster. Really for scrub radius, you just want it to be as close to zero as possible. That's your best bet. Now, what affects all this? Well, ride height. So if, and if we're rolling up to the car, we're going to do a pre-alignment inspection. One of those things is going to actually be ride height. So discussing ride height, a lot of times the alignment machine can tell you how to measure ride height, they even have some adapters and tools, but also TIS or other, or other service information can tell you how to do ride height. Sometimes you're measuring from the floor to the frame. Other times you're measuring from the center of the hub to the fender. I don't really know, but what I can tell you, it varies vehicle to vehicle, it absolutely needs to be level. So if you have a level spot in the shop, great. But not just kind of level, like level with a level, level. 
And the only spot I can guarantee that's level is the alignment rack. The alignment rack is leveled by the alignment rack installer. And a lot of times they'll fine tune it when they calibrate it too, right? So ride height, and it's measured with the standard vehicle weight. So, so BMWs are funny. Like if you go to do an alignment on a BMW, it'll tell you, oh, put 150 pound weight. It'll actually tell you something in kilograms, I don't know, 70 kilograms or whatever on the driver's seat and do the alignment. Like, why would I put weight in the seat? Well, it all comes down to a story I'm going to tell you. And this is going to be a little bit offensive, but um, I'd rather offend people a little and have them know the truth than be too afraid to tell stories like this and not have you learn. So we had, um, in fact, it, it wasn't actually even me. It was somebody that I knew, but I was talking with them during the, during this repair, a uh, guy come in with a minivan and the concern was a pull and he jumped in, noticed a couple things, didn't worry about it, did the alignment, hooked it up, gave it, shipped it. And the customer came back and said, Hey, it still pulls. So then he tried again to do the alignment and it still looked good. And so he tried to ship it again. The customer came back and said, Hey, it still pulls. Well, at this point we got to get real. Okay. And he noticed a few things and I even talked, to, talked it over with him when he sat in the seat, it said, he said it was like sitting in a crater first off. And then secondly, he said, when he went to put the seatbelt on, there was like a seatbelt clicking into another thing that would click in. That's what's called a seatbelt extender. So it's a seatbelt to a buckle and a buckle to another thing to clip in. That's because your seatbelt can't reach around. Okay. So there's quite a few clues to what this driver may look like. But again, you know, we're technicians, we're in the back. We don't really see the customer. We're kind of out of it. Well, he, he got his clues together and said, you know what? I'm going to talk with the advisor and say, hey, um, I have an idea. Send the customer back here. Customer comes back 400 pounds plus, like four, like full, like full 50. Big old hefty guy. Nice guy, no issues. But they had to tell the guy, look, if you want your car to go straight, you are going to get into your own car in the driver's seat. And he had it all in the alignment rack already. And the alignment was good. When the driver got in the alignment, in the, in the seat, it actually literally shifted over. It affected the ride height. The driver side got a little lower than the passenger side. That doesn't happen when you weigh 150. That ha does happen when you weigh full 50. And so this tech literally did the alignment with the customer in there. And it was a hard discussion to have, but you know, th that guy, he wanted his car fixed. He wasn't, people don't come to the dealership to hang out. They want their car fixed. So if it's something like that, you got to understand weight does affect it. And so while I think BMW is a little over the top with like 150, put a, put 150 pounds in the seat. I think it was less actually. I think it was more like 80. It was some small amount of weight. I'd say that's just dumb. If you really want to be technical, get the driver, put the driver in the car and do the alignment with the driver. And even that's kind of ridiculous. Okay, but that's still the point. Ride height affects caster and camber. And by the way, caster and camber, you know, we have to fix those before we do the tow. So like, basically you got to get it all dialed in with the customer in there if you want to have it perfect. Okay, so continuing. So if we got a ride height problem, I told you, it could be based on the, the hefty boy or it could be huh, weak or sagging springs. So I want to make something clear because we haven't gone too deep in suspension. Um, a vehicle that's sagging is that's not that's not a shock absorber. It's not a strut. That's spring. Spring holds the weight. Okay. So like if we have springs and they're kind of worn, that's going to affect the ride height. We don't really want a difference of more than a half inch from side to side. And I've seen many times where the left front tends to sag a little bit more because the left front's got the person in it all the time. Or if it's like a truck and they always got a bunch of stuff in the back, you can a lot of times have the 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 rear of the vehicle squatting and the front kind of coming up, that's going to affect our measurement. So we really need to get in this, get this ride height dialed in, get it, get it within spec, get it to where we want it, do the ride height first. Right. And now different types of alignments, 
this would be um, pretty simple. A front end alignment, we don't do those. We don't do front end alignments. Front end alignment is a term that never really went away. A front end alignment didn't look like this. That's where we'd literally be measuring the camber with like a bubble, measuring the caster with like a bubble. Uh, in fact, you couldn't even really measure the caster, to be honest with you. And then you'd, you'd measure the toe like with a tape measure, but you might do it with a little bit more fancy stuff on the machine. But a front end alignment is not taking into consideration the rear at all. So remember, when we do our toe, we usually are setting our front toe to match our rear toe to make up for that thrust angle. A front end alignment doesn't even know the thrust angle. It doesn't care about the thrust angle. It doesn't know any of that stuff. It just knows, I want my wheels straight ahead, period. So it relies on you centering the steering wheel really well, adjusting, you know, really, but it's not, a, it's not a good design and we don't do it. We haven't done it in many years, professionally anyway. And now a thrust angle alignment and a four wheel alignment are very closely related. It, we're gonna call it a four wheel alignment and I'm good with that. But technically, if you mount sensors on the back of a solid axle vehicle, like a truck, you're not doing a four wheel alignment. You can't do a four wheel alignment because you can't adjust it, but you're mounting the targets on the back to get a reference, and then you're matching the front wheels to the rear wheels with that thrust angle, and that's why it's a thrust angle alignment. I didn't name it, I just understand it. And then last but not least, and hopefully the most common for us, a four wheel alignment is just like a thrust angle alignment, except it's when the rear is adjustable and we can actually adjust the rear. So if you can adjust the rear first and then you adjust the front, you did a four wheel alignment. Have a nice day. Cool. Those are the types. Now, as we continue, um, here's an example of uh, the alignment machine in use. So like this one, for example, because these are green, if we can do adjustments back here, this is considered a four wheel alignment. You notice there's no caster on the rear because caster is the steering axis and the rear wheels don't steer. And I know you can find a couple exceptions, but generally speaking, the rear wheels don't steer. All right, so this one's a uh, pretty good uh, indication here. And I like the virtual view because you can see like this angle is gonna be camber. So the camber is good. If it was positive camber, it'd be out here. If it was negative camber, it'd be in here. And then you can see the toe. If the toe was positive, that's toe in, it'd be over here in the red. Toe out would be over here in the red. And then the camber, I mean, the uh, caster I like because they put it right on the strut. So if you, if you look, this is the front of the car, if your caster is more positive, that's when this angle, this, this arrow is going to kind of come back at you, right? It's going to come back. So the virtual view is cool. But generally, we work off the bar graphs. And when we're at the, when, when they're on the bar graphs, the numbers mean something. So generally, if you're looking at numbers, and this is, this is actually an ASC concept. So when you're looking at numbers, um, zero degrees means exactly that zero but if we get a quarter of a degree what the heck does that mean in decimal units well a quarter is 0.25 well that's easy enough right a quarter is 0.25 a half would be a 0.5 and a three quarter would be a 0.75 that's pretty easy the older alignment machines would actually have zero a quarter 12 a half three quarter but the new alignment machines we've really gone to decimal now where this gets a little weird is the ASE can, and rightfully so if they want, they can use minutes and degrees of an arc. So like minutes is, um, it's kind of like degrees, but it's degrees broken down to a 60th. So in one degree, there's up to, there's 60 minutes, kind of like time. So if, you had a quarter of a degree, that'd be 0.25. That would also be 15 minutes of an arc. Whoa, kind of like tenths of an hour flat rate system. A half would be again 0.5, that'd be 30 minutes, three quarters 0.75, and that's 45 minutes, All right? So, just so you all understand. And then one degree is 1.0 degrees is 60 minutes. 
I've seen uh, on the ASC where they may say something about like, uh, they might give you some specs and they may say the spec is zero degrees plus or minus 15 minutes. So that's like, I automatically get rid of the minutes because I don't like the minutes. And I'd say, oh, that's a quarter of a degree. So the spec is plus a quarter and minus a quarter. Anywhere in minus to plus a quarter is in spec. See what I mean? So, but you you do at least need to understand minutes. Cool. Now we will continue. The number line is something I want you guys to think about. There are times on the ASC where I literally draw a number line because it's hard for me to understand. If I gave you a question, the left side camber is negative 0.5 and the right side is positive 0.5. What's the difference? And you're like 0.5, negative 0.5 minus positive 0.5 is, or is it five, positive 5 and negative point? The number lines can simplify that. So I said a 0.5, right? 0.5 is a half, so I would make this a 0.5, by the way. But if, if we were... Um, a negative half to a positive half, what's the difference between the two? You can, you can see it better on the line. It's a negative half down and a positive half up. That's a whole one degree right there. Make sense? So if you have one that's over here at a negative half and another one that's over here at a positive half, they have a difference of one degree. If your negative, if your camber on the left is negative half and your camber on the right is positive half, that's a difference of one degree. One degree cross camber is too much. Makes sense. You got to be able to look at the numbers and then visualize the number line or draw the number line on the paper if you want and then actually see the difference between the two. So I've seen many times where people are like, well, this one's a half and this one's a, a negative half. It's the same. No, no, no. no. It's a whole degree apart. Right? So just... Generally, using the number line is good. Now, if we had one at a negative one degree and one at a positive one degree, we're like, well, what's a negative plus one, a positive one plus a negative one is a zero, so it's fine. Nope. Number line. You got a whole degree over here and then a whole another degree over here. Those are two degrees apart. Make sense? Two degrees apart is way out of spec on a cross camber or cross camber uh, cross caster situation. So don't be shy to use the line. Now performing an alignment. Okay, just, just a brief overview. When we're doing the alignment, really what you're doing, you're going to follow what the machine says. The machine's going to do next illustrations going to tell you, turn this bolt, loosen this thing, tighten that thing, do whatever. One of them is going to be something like this eccentric that I showed you, right? But just as an overview, you may have one type of rear toe adjustment, a different type of rear toe adjustment. Like if it's a front adjustment, you may actually have a caster adjustment that's, that's, that has to do with the strut rod, like a Honda likes this design. You can actually loosen this nut, loosen this nut, and then actually thread them both together to draw this caster more positive. So um, it depends on the vehicle, but Again, you're going to go on the machine and the machine's going to illustrate adjustments for you. It's a beautiful thing. Um, one of these, for example, that's an eccentric. I'm going to chat about that eccentric right now. Um, and you can, see the, you can see the photos and you can even obtain all the specs from either the website or our machine gets periodic updates. They come and they put a chip in it and they upload the, the latest things on the chip. So it's accessing that. It's more, more or less like a thumb drive. Um, a USB stick, if you will. And so our machine is going to have a lot of the specs. If you ever had to do a car and the specs weren't in there, you can get the specs from TIS and you can load the specs into the machine yourself. We used to get a guy who had a Corvette and he would go road racing and he would show up with his own alignment specs and just request that we align the car to his specs. And he would go to different tracks. So depending on where he was going, he would do different specs in different tracks. So that was pretty cool. And you can do that too. Now, before we do the alignment, we need to do the pre-alignment inspection. So we're going to do a universal process, but you'd need to apply it a little more specifically to what you're working on. 
So let's just give an example. Um, remove any heavy items from the trunk, passenger compartments. Now, do not remove any items that are come with the vehicle from the factory, right? So like the Terminex truck, for example, we're not removing the racks and all that stuff because that's what's normally there. But if the customer shows up and they got a bunch of junk in the trunk and you want alignment, we're actually supposed to take the junk out of the trunk according to service info because you don't know if the junk's going to be there normally. And remember, that all affects the ride height, which affects the alignment, the numbers, right? Now, this is one I saw quite a few people practicing alignments, and I didn't see very many people do this. Check all four tires for the proper size and adjust the pressure to spec. So you need to check the tires first, set the tire pressure. Additionally, check the ride height, as you can see. So this one may, may spec a level surface to the fender liner. I don't know. A lot of times we're going hub to the fender liner. Sometimes we're going alignment rack to the frame. Other times it'll, spe it'll specify it in the, in the service manual, but this is a good example. Additionally, check the play of the steering wheel. We're inspecting tie rods. We're looking at bushings. You don't do the alignment if it also needs work. Let's say you have a loose tie rod end. If your tie rod end is loose, you're gonna be trying to set the alignment. You're gonna get the adjustment perfect, but there's looseness. There's looseness in the tie rod. It's gonna be like, oh, I got it in spec, and then I bump it and all of a sudden it's way out of spec, and I bump it and it's in spec, and I bump. You can't do an alignment if stuff is loose. It's just, you can't do it. So do all that inspection first. Additionally, Jounce the vehicle, check to see if the shocks are good. So we're overall doing a suspension inspection, basically. Uh, and then visually inspect, look for defects, wheel bearings, loose parts, um, anything that'll affect the steering, suspension, or the ride height. Okay, replace those first. And, and then again, remember, when you're on the alignment rack, you're tying up the alignment rack. And there's probably not enough alignment racks to go around. So that's basically like the hot seat. You have to have all your stuff taken care of before you roll up on the alignment rack. Do all your business first and then go to the alignment rack. Don't go to the alignment rack and then realize something wasn't right. So I'll give you an example. I, I, when I was new, I did a tie rod end and like, you know, I understood alignments, but I hadn't really done very many alignments. And, you know, I, I, I was in a, in a GM dealer where we had specialized stuff happening. So the front end alignment guy, that's what he did. So we would do the work and then he'd send it to him and he'd do the alignment. So when, when I did the tie rod end, I wasn't real careful with it. I just like spun the tie rod in somewhere, you know, where I thought and tightened it up and sent it to him. And when he got it up on his alignment rack, he was like, man, that tie rod end is so far off. I had to actually... He, meaning he, so I'm saying his word. I had to actually lift the car on the off the turn plates on the on the cross jack and then pull the wheel off, pop the tire end off, and I had to actually spin it a whole bunch more times. Like it was not even close. And he was kind of reaming my butt, and I deserved that. He's like, you know, rah, 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 rah. the alignment, rah, rah, rah. the alignment rack is not the place to basically finish your suspension work. Get everything in, get it close. It should be on the alignment rack as little time as possible because that's, you know, a money-making piece of equipment right there. So after a verbal spanking, I was a good boy, and now I understand it better. I'm just saying when I was brand new, I was kind of a ding-dong. Maybe I'm a little bit of a ding-dong, but I'm less of a ding-dong than I was. There's a whole country song about that, pretty sure. Um, and then when we do that, we're going to position on the turntables, mount the targets, calibrate. Now, this is the procedure. Rear camber, rear toe, which changes the thrust angle, right? Front caster, front ca camber, re-sweep the caster. If it's good, then do the toe. If you re-sweep the caster and it's bad, you're going right back to here. And caster and camber... If you change caster, it affects your camber. Not to say that your camber affects your caster, but the problem is a lot of times you're adjusting a control arm and the control arm's in the shape of an A. And so if you're trying to change caster, it's unintentionally changing camber. Caster and camber a lot of times use the same bolts, 
the same eccentric. So if you change one, you're probably messing up the other. Now, Roberto, I see your hand up. I don't know how long it's been up, but go ahead. Just a quick question on the for the weight of the alignments. Does yeah. the amount of fuel in your car affect that at all? Because I know that that's a, that's a good question. Tank and stuff like that, and it weighs. So yeah, that's see to me, I would I don't get real uptight on that because the car can be almost empty or it can be full, so we can't really control that. The car's normal operating is going to vary some amount in weight, and that's why when BMW said to put like a hundred something pounds in the driver's seat, I kind of giggled because it's like that tank of gas weighs as much as a person. So are we also going to verify the amount of, we're going to fill up the gas before we align it? Are we going to drain it? You know, so technically you're right. You got the concept, but in reality, it's sort of like an engineer would make a big thing of that because the engineer is going to spend a lot of time on the details and not realize there's an expectation by the customer that that alignment's done in an hour. We're not going to do all this crazy stuff. All right, so don't even really worry about those details. If we're talking a 450 pound passenger, that could make a difference. A hundred and something pound fuel, I guess it kind of makes a difference, but we're not gonna really worry about it too much. Good question. Um, and so this kind of makes sense. So let's we'll run through it. You jump up on there and you're like, oh, the toe, I gotta set the toe and let it go. But if you set the front toe, and then you set the rear toe. Now you messed up your front toe. And then if you go all toe crazy, and then you realize, oh, I'm going to change my camber, camber messes up the toe. And then if you set the toe again, and then you change the caster, caster messes up the camber and messes up the toe. So you have to really do it in this order. Rear camber, rear toe, front caster, front camber, resweep the caster, because it's not a live measurement, remember? And then the front toe, and then verify it all. And if it's all good, should be good to go. And at that point, a lot of times it's gonna prompt you about the steering wheel. So we're centering the steering wheel, we're adjusting the total toe, and it, you know, it should be good. When you do this, click adjust toe with wind toe. Don't waste my time. Because if you just start adjusting the toe and then you're like, oh, my, my steering wheel's off center. Well, yeah, that's because you didn't jump up in there, start the car, level the steering wheel, lock the steering wheel, and carefully do the adjustment. And if you click wind toe, it tells you step by step what to do. And not only that, when you click wind toe and you jump up there and you level the steering wheel like it's telling you to do on screen, and then you come down and you click ready, boom, it saves that in the computer. So if when you're doing the alignment, you start to move the tires a little bit, you don't totally lose track of it. So what, what I'm telling you is if you do adjust toe with wind toe, you don't really need to lock the steering wheel. It saved it as long as you clicked ready. Before there was a just toe with wind toe, you'd have to lock the steering wheel and you'd have to be careful because it's not hard. You, when you're doing that work down there, you can, you can move the wheel and next thing you know, your steering wheel is off center. You do the whole alignment to a off center steering wheel then you get to redo it. Don't ask me how I know. I don't want to tell you. All right. So again, rear camber adjustment, it's, it's a possibility. Rear toe adjustment. And this is where we're going to get into um, those eccentrics. So like in this example, here's an adjust, they'll call this a turnbuckle. This is like a tie rod kind of, you'll actually loosen the jam nuts and then you'll actually spin the rod. So you a lot of times need a wrench to spin the rod, but those are pretty nice. It might actually have a tie rod end. Uh, a lot of times it, it doesn't in the rear, but it can. Uh, and then let's say it's a solid rear, like a Corolla. It's got basically a beam rear suspension. There's no adjustments. That doesn't mean you can't fix it. So way too many texts are saying, it's not adjustable, I don't care. Well, it's not adjustable, but there's a way to adjust it. And that would be a shim. So there's going to be uh, a video and an assignment for a shim. This is the shim right here. The shim is like a wedge. So let's just say you had toe in. You'd actually unbolt the wheel bearing, put a wedge in there, and that's going to, that's going to like a doorstop wedge is going to actually push the toe straight. It's a piece of plastic that's thicker on one side and thinner on the other side. And it goes, but, but you have to literally undo the hub bearing. You got to go pretty deep in there. So this may be a several hour upsell. 
So if your labor rate at your dealer is 200 an hour, you're talking 600 bucks, they're probably not going to buy it. But that's not to say it's that you should say it's not adjustable. It's not adjustable from the factory, but we have an aftermarket solution at $600. Like, forget that. I don't care. Makes sense. So don't, don't be, you know, don't be a super flat rate. Oh, don't, don't know, don't care. Set the toe and let it go guy. Um, I, I'll deny you. Be like, nope. Nope. Don't know you. Never knew you. Depart. Depart. Uh, and then when you get ready, when, when you watch this video, you're going to notice there's little room to cut out for the bolts and there's a marker for where the shim needs to face and the alignment machine will, will calculate where that marker should be. Should it be at 12, should it be at three, should it be at nine, right? The machine's pretty cool, but you have to tell it exactly what, to, what, uh, what um, shim it is. Now something fun, this is not a manufacturer fix. So I saw that message on the, on the chat. PIS has a lot of good info and I'm going to show you, but with regard to the rear adjustment on something with a solid beam style, like a dead axle, it's going to tell you there is none. And then on the Hunter machine, if you click tools and kits, it's going to say this is available. If you click adjust toe with this type of suspension, it's going to say adjust toe using shims. There's actually a different symbol that'll pop up. You'll be like, what the heck is that? Again, the customer's probably not going to buy it, but it is there. Now this is the turnbuckle, right? So loosen, loosen. And when you turn this, it's gonna lengthen the rod or shorten the rod. You might as well just start turning one direction when the machine says you're getting better, that's how you know you're going the right way. But there's another one, the eccentric right here. So we'll take a look at this. This eccentric, you can see this bolt is slightly off to the left. If the bolt's slightly off to the left, it's going to turn this whole rod slightly to the left, which means it's actually pushing outward. All right, so now we want to look at this, this um, eccentric. So if you look, this bolt is kind of off center from this ramp. When I, let's say that it's going to push up against this, a type of a tab, okay? If it's pushing up against a tab like this, this would be the lowest setting. As I turn it up and start to ramp it, I want you to notice the bolt is getting higher and higher on the top of the screen. That would push a component upward, right? I'll start over. It's gonna go higher and higher and higher as it ramps. And then this is gonna go lower and lower and lower. That's the lowest point. Technically you could turn it backwards and bump it right up to the highest point, but that's pretty tough to do. That's it. This is the eccentric. If I see another student turn an eccentric 15 times and be like, it's not getting any closer. Yeah. It, this is the maximum right there. That's the maximum. And this is the minimum. You can turn it 100 times if you want. That's it. So let's say in this situation here, you um, are trying to get the toe out. If you look at this eccentric, it's fairly centered. If you want the toe out, we're going to turn it this way. That's going to bring the bolt all the way to the right, which is going to actually pull the top, pull this rod all the way to the right. Once you pass that point, if you keep turning, it's going to start to get closer and close. It's going to get further and further out of spec. So you're trying to get it in spec. It's getting closer, 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 closer. And then it starts to get further away, further away, further away, further away. The furthest away, closer, 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 further, 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 further. Like you shouldn't have to turn it that many times to figure it out. You, if if that means the eccentric is maxed out, if you turn it all the way to the to one side, where it's at the maximum ramp, right? The maximum ramp, the maximum ramp, and it's not in spec. That means the eccentric is maxed out, and that's it. You're done. You can't get any more. Now, why? Well, let's just say maybe maybe this rod is bent right here. Maybe you can actually see that this toe adjustment rod is bent. Maybe something else. We might need to do a little bit more diagnosis, right? But at least you can visualize the eccentric. Now, on Toyotas, I want to be very clear about this. The eccentric sits in these little metal tabs. And when you turn it, 
it's anticipating ramping against those metal tabs. But when you do that, it puts a lot of force on the metal tabs. And it's not unheard of to spread those tabs up, spread those tabs open, and then they're kind of messed up. And then you're trying to straighten them. And those are tack welded to the frame. So if I go to turn an eccentric, I'm watching these tabs carefully. And if they start to get messed up, I'll actually take the weight off of the vehicle and get it adjusted where I think and lower it down. Now, if that sounds familiar, that's because we did that on Edward's truck. He started cranking it. I started watching the tab start to lay down a little bit and said, hold up. Let's at least get the weight off of it. If you lift the car all the way up, the wheel spins and your alignment, you know, your, your, your heads are no longer um, compensated like you do the rolling compensation. So we're just going to take the weight off it and you'll find it'll be easier to turn. Also, don't loosen this too much because this little eccentric disc, if that comes out away from the, from the tabs and then you tighten it up, I've seen people flatten the tabs, totally flattened out. So you can, it's a good, the eccentric's a good design, but you gotta, you gotta be paying attention to that. Whereas the turnbuckle is a little more forgiving. And by the way, the aftermarket mostly will take the eccentrics away and go to a turnbuckle style. I, I put one in them. My Tesla, the, the Tesla, the turnbuckle style tends to have more adjustment. This one, if you look at it on the lowest setting to the highest setting, you're talking like maybe a quarter inch of adjustment right there. Maybe a little more than a quarter, but not much. That's all you get. A turnbuckle could potentially give you an inch or more of adjustment, but it's all in what the manufacturer, you know, puts in from factory. Now this one, I want to tell you, I don't really go by this. But TIS will spec all about how many degrees, how many notches, how many things. And you can read this chart and graduations and you can figure out how much it's going to change it. But, but and how much the camber and the and the how much camber is going to affect tow and et cetera. But but generally, I don't really spend a lot of time on this in the curriculum because we're using the alignment machine. I don't know what they do in Japan. I don't. Hunter's an American company. I have no idea what they're doing in Japan. So with us, we don't even really look at the service menu for this, but it's a nice feature that you can see these little dotted lines. Remember, in our, in our demo, we made a little mark, and then we counted the number of lines, and we counted the number of lines. So you can, they're a good reference point, but I don't use this to do the alignment, personally. It does show tie rod end, though. That's kind of nice, just showing, like, if you turn the turnbuckle this way, it's shortening the rod. And if you turn it this way, it's lengthening the rod. Cool. Um, and then here's the eccentrics shown again. So just so you guys can see, the eccentrics have the ability to adjust in all directions. So this is the part that gets a little tricky. If let's say we determine that there's insufficient caster, we need more caster, that would mean we want to pull this ball joint forward. To pull this ball joint forward, we'd actually want to take this eccentric and rotate it to kick the bottom part of the A out. If we kick the bottom part of the A out, it's going to pivot and swing this forward. But while we do that, it's also going to swing it outward, right? So it's going to bring forward of the car, but also outward. So yes, we're increasing our caster, but we also just made our camber more negative. And that's why camber and caster are so related, I'll just say. So if we're trying to swing it forward, we could also draw this part of the, of the control arm inward, right? If we pull that in and you picture it, in is going to pull this forward, but it's also going to pull it inward. And that's going to make our caster, our camber uh, more positive. So we start with caster because caster is the more complex to adjust. And let's say we get our caster dialed, but we let's say that we need this, this ball joint, we moved it forward to up here, perfect. But we need our camber now, and to, to fix our camber, we need the ball joint outward. What we would do, we can make a mark on those little notches, and then move this one out, let's say two lines, and then move this one out, two lines. If you move them the same amount, it's not gonna affect your caster. It's only gonna push the ball joint outward. Two lines, three lines, I don't really know. But at least 
you definitely want to understand which direction the eccentric is going to move the arm. Kind of make sense? Kind of crazy? All right. Last little note on this one. If my camber is good, but my caster is bad, one thing you may try that'll keep you close is let's say that you need to pull this one in one and this one out one, and that's to get your caster more positive. What if you literally make a mark and you draw this in one line and push this one out one line? That should negate very much camber change and give you mostly caster change. It's not perfect, but at least if you get the concept, you can know. When I get to this point, I ignore the machine. I literally adjust it based on where I figure it needs to be. And then, yes, sometimes you'll see me cheat. I'll walk to the outside of the car. I'll feel where the wheel is with regard to the fender and to the, to the front of the door or the bumper and the, and the, and the rear of the fender. I'll, I'll kind of make sure that I have them centered about the same. And, and you know, I'm using all sorts of little little observations that I have. I don't just look at the machine and turn it the way it says, because a lot of times the machine thinks you're adjusting the upper control arm when you're adjusting the lower. So it'll tell you to go the wrong direction. And then you'll think you're good. And then you'll resweep the caster and be like, what the heck? I made it worse. I quit. I'm, I can't do this. And then you just say, you know what? On every car now, I'm just going to set the toe and let it go. And I believe that's why a lot of techs are like that. I think not only are they lazy, I think they actually gave it a shot and it, they took too much time and it beat them up and they just quit. That's what I really think. So no Mahdi caster, uh, I mean, uh, eccentrics are used on all sorts of cars, all makes models. This control arm design is pretty common on Toyota trucks and SUVs. Other vehicles can use it. Other vehicles could use actually an upper control arm with eccentrics. And some even use other types. So this is talking about the Toyota Eccentrics. You know, so so Toyota can actually uh, get quite a bit of um, uh, quite a bit of adjustability. And you'd actually look at this, and you could you could determine how it's going to go based on if you're turning the uh, the up the uh, forward cam or the rear cam. But again, this is the stuff that you're going to see in in service info. Um, I see that. No, both of these eccentrics, both, both of them can adjust both camber and caster. I wish one was for camber and one was for caster. It doesn't really work that way. It's all about the positioning of the A. So if I make the A, you can see the A. If I need my ball joint over here, I can do that by pushing this one out and pulling this one in. Or pulling this one in only, or pushing this one out only. All those would move my ball joint. But unfortunately, if I pull in, it also not only moved it this way, it moved it down, see? So then I might also want to push this one out to get it back up. So it's like basically a three-dimensional adjustment of caster and camber all as one. So that's why on this style, when you're adjusting caster, I'm going to tell you right now, you're pretty much adjusting camber too. You just hopefully can keep track of where you're moving it, right? And now another fun fact, um, you've, done, you've done Camrys, Corollas, and you've heard it said many times, oh, well, the manufacturer doesn't specify camber adjustments, so we can't adjust that. Well, this is a Toyota document, and this right here shows you about the bolts. So if you've got, this is the, uh, this is the original bolt, it's kind of fat, and then an adjustment bolt's actually a little thinner and it makes uh, some room. You could actually go from the, the stock bolt to using a one dot bolt will give you, oops, will give you uh, some amount of adjustability. I think it is, oh yeah, 15 minutes. See that? 15 minutes is a quarter of a degree. Now here's why. I'm gonna make this into a regular bolt temporarily. And there's a picture that I'm going to show you, but, but just for summary, this bolt goes into a hole. And if, if the hole's this size, there's not much wiggle room. But if you put in a smaller bolt, now see this wiggle room? Now I can actually fine tune the camber a little bit because look, it's going into the, it's the knuckle to the strut. 
Now, if the strut stays the same, but the bolt's a little loose, I can loosen the bolt. And because now it's kind of sloppy, I can yank on this, yank on the wheel, yank on the wheel and tire, hold it in place, and then gun it down. And it'll actually give me a little bit of camber adjustment. If you only need a quarter of a degree, you just need a one dot bolt. If you need more, you can go to a two dot bolt. A two dot bolt's even smaller. It's, a, it's even smaller. So now you got more wiggle, but only enough for about a half a degree. If you go to a, now this is what's kind of interesting. You could go to a three dot bolt and that'll give you up to 45 degrees. But here's what's crazy. What if you went with, a one a one dot bolt on the upper and a three dot bolt on the lower you could actually get a whole degree you could get a whole degree of camber and if you wanted to go full on maximum you could put a three dot bolt and a three dot bolt so you have an upper and a lower bolt and both of them are three dots you can get one and a half degrees a degree in 30 minutes there's a lot of adjustment if you use these toyota bolts and your parts department should have them. These are the part numbers you can make a note. Will most techs do it? No. Most techs will say, rah, 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 rah. it's not adjusted. And the reason why I feel for them, you know where I come from, so I get it. The alignment pays an hour. The one hour doesn't include you changing strut bolts and going to parts and getting other bolts and whatever. So they're just like, I'm not going to do it. Um, and remember, the dealer. The dealer is good in a lot of ways. It's got the latest and greatest technology. It comes with training, et cetera. But the dealer gets a lot of new customers. Everybody who buys a car from your dealership's a potential customer, especially with Toyota Care. You get several oil changes to impress them. Uh, an independent shop is trying to take really good care of the customer because they don't get new customers very often. And they have to advertise and do work to get customers in. So they're a little more inclined to do a super good job at, at, at keeping those customers, right? So an independent shop, or let's just say a technician with that type of mindset, right? Some of you may start your own businesses someday. If you have that type of mindset, I need to take good care of the customer because I want to build loyalty and trust and I want to keep them because I'm going to fix their car and I'm going to make money off of them. And that's how I'm going to support my family. I'm going to help them do their things so that they can pay me to support my family. That's healthy. That's the type of person who's going to actually try to get the camber dialed in and get it fixed. I would bill though. Now don't, don't, I'm kind of a nice guy. I want to help people, but, but not at, but not for charity. You know, like there's times where I'll do charitable work, but not really for customers. You know, it, there's a, there's a, someday you'll catch on, but there's a saying, you don't muzzle the ox. The ox's job is to, is to work the mill and go in circles and grind grain. It grinds grain, it grinds grain all day. A good owner of the ox will not muzzle the ox, which means when the ox hungry, the ox can eat some grain. You fixing this customer car and using the different bolts and really hooking it up and get it dialed in. You're an ox. You're pulling for the customer. You're fixing something that was going to cost them money because it was tire wear. Tire wear costs them money. So if you're going to fix it for them, you'd expect to not be muzzled. Now, if the customer is not willing to pay for it, then we're not going to fix it. And a lot of times, to be honest with you, customers aren't willing to pay for it. They're just going to be like, ah, ah. all right, cool. But, but I would still say at least give them the option. You come up with the price. You go to parts, say, hey, how much for the three dot bolts? How many bolts do you need? And then figure the labor, whatever you think that the labor should be. It shouldn't be all that tough. You could actually probably put those bolts in without pulling the wheel. But, uh, you know, come up with a price and try to sell it. If they buy it, cool. And if they don't, you didn't tell them it's not adjustable because that wasn't true. That was, that was a lie. It was adjustable. It just isn't adjustable for free. Cool. And with those parts, you need parts and you need labor. And then this is another example of the eccentric. You can see this eccentric uh, bracket is a little more beefy than some of the Toyota ones. This one's welded on the back. It's pretty beefy. Um, there's, there's other ways though. This is old school, but to adjust camber and caster here on the old school one, we'd actually undo this nut 
and you could slide shims. See this thing right here? That's a little shim. I have some at the school. It's a shim with a handle. You can drop the shims in. So same as the eccentric, right? When we make the A, if you want this elbow up, boom, you add shims. If you want this elbow down, you remove shims. But there was no eccentrics. These were cool, but they were kind of tough to get to. Like a, like a 92 Toyota truck would have those. Those were actual shims. And in the, in the alignment machine, you'd open a drawer and there'd be a whole bunch of shims in there. Kind of makes sense on the shims. And then this is just a, a drive, drive shaft inclinometer. But one of the reasons I show it is people will modify something like this and get it to attach to the hub to actually adjust their camber. So there's a couple ways to do it. Um, and then again, if it's shims, you can get them like a 64th, maybe all the way up to a quarter of an inch. So that's like, uh, you know, different sizes, almost like wheel weights. And you can stack them too. You could, use, you could use a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. There might be a limit, but you can use more than one shim. Um, and they're not really, they're not real common. There's a different type of shim I was showing you for the rear of a solid axle, a dead axle. Um, that's plastic and it's put behind the backing plate. Um, be under the wheel bearing. You actually unbolt the hub assembly and the backing plate, put it back there. I've seen them put in a couple of different spots, but that's the idea. And then eccentrics, of course. So um, sometimes this one, for example, is a strut rod that's going to pull this control arm forward. You'll actually be able to loosen a nut, loosen a nut, and then, and then turn them both to draw this whole thing forward. That would be a little less common, but I, like I said, I did see them on um hondas a little bit so that's kind of a funny funny adjustment method but there's a few of them out there um and then there's adjusting sleeves which i believe i show um and this is camber i did want to show this one really good so those things i was saying with the bolts this gives you a pretty good idea of the adjustment and do not be shocked if on the asc they have that concept so if if you were to let's say take out these stock bolts and then put on that Toyota bolt, there's just some wiggle room. But aftermarket manufacturers have also made a bolt that's like an eccentric. You can slide the bolt in and then you can actually turn the bolt and that'll, that'll pivot the knuckle. It's a skinnier bolt, but it's got an egg shape on it. But the egg shape is inside in here. And that'll ramp your knuckle this way or ramp your knuckle this way. And that's actually probably even better than the Toyota 1 dot, 2 dot, or 3 dot bolts. And um, like Moog, Moog makes them. Some other companies make them. So that's kind of a, a, a cool thing to consider. They may call that a camber kit. Camber kit, uh, maybe, it just literally may be the two bolts for the strut. It's a camber kit. One of them anyway. Cool. And then... Um, Regarding toe, here we get into the rack and pinion a little bit. So if you're um, doing a toe adjustment, Toyota specifies remove the clamp. But for me, sometimes I'll shoot some WD-40 right there and let the, the clamp will go up. The uh, boot, the bellows boot on the rack will glide better. And I can just do the adjustment because what we're doing, we're going to loosen the lock nut and then we're going to spin the inner tie rod to get it, let's say, shorter or longer or Either way, right? And then we're just going to fine tune that and do this while doing wind tow. This was the tie rod adjusting sleeve I was saying. Old school trucks, it wasn't just the inner and outer tie rod uh, from the rack. This would be more for like a, like a steering box style. And there was actually a tool. You'd loosen the bolt, loosen the button. There was a bolt and there's a claw type tool that would grab the adjusting rod and you'd turn the adjusting rod. And the adjusting rod would lengthen or shorten. Um, those were cool, but what this is saying here, this is the open side. Don't leave that facing up because then it fills with water at rust and you're going to have a real tough time moving it. Put it on the bottom so it doesn't rust. You, you might just fine tune the adjustment and spin the whole assembly, but this is the way that it needs to be. And so these are discontinued. But if it's a 90s or earlier truck, you may actually see them. Cool. And then this is what that uh, sleeve actually looks like. So if you ever see something like this, that's the adjustment sleeve. It's, it's really a very similar process. It's just rather than a jam nut, 
you're doing a couple bolts and using the claw tool, which I would not buy. And then by the time you're done, you'll be finished. Now, there's there's um, something that was not very well explained here, and that has to do with uh, coming up with a spec. So here's the here's the spec: negative 0.7 to a 0.8. Are we in spec at negative 0.1? Answer should be yes. And so you, you're going to look at the spec and, um, and, and basically on the alignment machine, you're going to use the bar graph and you're just going to get it in the middle ish. But unfortunately, on the ASC, they may not have some like this. This makes it really easy. What they may have is just some numbers in a chart. So like, if you look at this, obviously this camber's in spec and this one's just barely in spec, but it's in spec. And then this one's mm, kind of on the outside, but still in spec. And this one's just barely in spec. And these ones are actually pretty good, right? So you can see that quickly, but unfortunately the ASC is gonna give it to you a little different. And that'll be the last thing that we cover. I'm gonna use um, paint to try to help you understand some of the math. But before we do, here's that subframe or cradle alignment. So like, here's your whole entire subframe. And if it gets moved, that can affect some things. So this one, for example, if this one was rotated forward right here, that's actually gonna affect your caster because this is up. Um, or this one, for example, this one was shifted to the right and that's gonna affect your camber. So what would we do? We'd have to loosen the subframe put a pry bar over here and shove the subframe this way to stand those tires up. What that would look like is maybe this one's one degree positive and this one's one degree negative. If they're, if they're equal but opposite, it's probably because the subframe moved. So we could actually uh, shift the subframe and get it back into spec. Cool, so that is when we move on. I need to pull paint over here. Come on, sweetheart. So I'm going to totally make it up off the top of my head. Let's say we've got a spec. And uh, I believe I can do a text box. So we're going to go with um, camber. Let's make it a um, 0, 0 0.0 plus slash minus 0.5 degrees. Okay, that's everything you need to know. We need to know the range. So if ASC gives you something like this and you're like, hmm, okay. Remember that number line thing that we did? So if I wanna draw a shape, I like to make the number line right here. And then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna change over to brushes and I make this one zero. You can make fun of my math if you want, but here's zero, okay? That's the perfect spec, zero dollars. But the spec is plus slash minus 0.5. What the heck is that? Well, that means plus, plus would be this way. And right here, this is a 0.5. And this is a 1.0. And this is a 1.0. Five. Now the other is true. This is a negative 0.5, negative half. This, you guessed it, would be a negative 1.0. And this would be, you guessed it, a negative 1.5. Cool? So the spec, I'm going to change colors now, would be what? It's zero plus 0.5 and minus 0.5. So anywhere in that range would be fair. So what if I gave you a number of 0.7? I need to know in spec or out of spec. Anybody care to share? It's out of spec, no? Out of spec is correct. Exactly. Very good because it's 
right? We drew the little spec. It's a half to a half, negative half to a positive half. 0.7 is out. All right, how about this? 0.25. That would be in. No, it's out. Where is it? Where's a 0.25? Where's 0.25 live? live That's in spec, right? Exactly. So that'd be in spec. Now, what if I gave you a negative 0.45? Where's that live? It's like right on the line, which is in spec. Yep. You see that? So that would be in spec, just barely, okay? Now, I gave it to you easy. Now what I'm going to do is say, sorry, more complicated issue. Let's go with caster 0.7. Actually, we're going to do, how about a, yeah, 0.7 plus or minus, I definitely did not go as planned. Man, I am struggling, plus, no, that's plus, or minus, uh, let's do a 0. 0.7. That's a weird one. So guess what? The first thing we should do is we should change to red for your sake. Now, the spec is 0. 0.7. So where's 0. 0.7? 0. 0.7 would be like right about here, would you say? All right, crooked line, forgive me. Let's say that I gave you a number of measurement of about 1.5. What do you guys think? Out of spec. Out of spec. I agree. What if I gave you 1.3? Out of spec. Is it? Here's how I'm going to help you. So you're tempted to just jump on it, but this is what I do. I literally draw this line, just like I do my little thing. I know how to pass. I'm going to draw this line. I'm going to say 0.7, and then it's plus or minus 0.7. So what is 0.7 is right here. Plus 0.7 would run me all the way to what? What's 7 plus 7? 7 plus 7, 14, right? So that would be a 1.4. So we can go as high as 1.4. Now, what's points? Okay, that's all I'm going to say, actually. All right. So 1.3 is right on the border, but it's in spec, right? It can go all the way up to 1.4. See how I got that number? 0.7, right here. 0.7 plus 0.7 is 1.4. Oh, yeah. But 0.7 minus 0.7 equals what? What's 0.7 minus 0.7? It's zero. Exactly, zero. So this range is zero to 1.4. So if I gave you a negative 0.2 in spec or out of spec? Out of spec? Exactly, because our range is zero to 1.4. Exactly, that's how you do it. Now I'll give you a worse one, okay? Because I was pretty nice to you so far, but I'm not going to be that nice anymore. Let's say we've got a... Let's cross this one off now. Let's <clears throat> go with a, how about a camber of 0. 0.6 plus or minus 0. 0.8, okay? Again, I'd start with this line. And if I told you, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a tough one right now. If I told you, um, in fact, let me let me draw three, and then I, I want you to think about them. Point 
well, uh, or sorry, 1.1 1 .1 negative 0 0.1 negative 0 0.3. Mm. Now let me think about them for a second. And I'm even going to know the one. Negative point 0.2. Okay, let's go with the... We could do these one at a time, but my point kind of being... Think about each of these. Get your ideas together. And then don't be lazy. Just draw the number, right? Point 0.6 would be right here. Make this a point 0.6. And then it's plus 0.8. So then I have to go 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Right? I literally do 0. 0.6 plus 0. 0.8. It's a plus. Equals 1.4. And then this is where it gets tricky. 6 minus point, point 0.6 minus 0.8. Point 0.6 minus point 0.8. Well, if you got $6 and your bill's $8, you ain't got no dollars. You owe two more dollars. See what I'm saying? So on the number line, I think it makes a lot of sense. This goes right up to 1.4. But then it goes up 0.8. Then it has to go down 0.8. So that's going to be down to a negative 0.2. So your range is negative 0.2 to 1.4. Is 1.1 in spec? Yes. Is negative 0.1 in spec? Yes. Is negative 0.3 in spec? No. It's an X. That's a fail. That's a no. Is negative 0.2 in spec? Yes. Is it in or out? Because it's right on the line. And your first in your first well, answer, was... it that's in spec. It's saying 0 0.6, 0 0.6 plus or minus 0.8 is the spec. It's saying it's good up to this point. So negative 0.2 is exactly the spec, but that's in spec. Barely though, just barely. So yes, if it's on the number, that's still in spec. It's off the number, it's out of spec. Cool. You guys think you understand the math? Doesn't matter if it's caster, doesn't matter if it's camber, um, toe, it's they're gonna give you the specs. Now the other thing that they may do, I'm gonna, we're gonna back some of this off here, is they may show you something along the lines of um, your left camber is point or your right camber is negative point, mm, let's go with a two. The max cross camber is a point five. So what do you think about that question? Right, I would draw the same thing. I do left side is at a point four. So we got right here. A point four. Right side is a negative point two. That's down here. What's the difference? Well, it's four. And that's what's weird. You're saying like four plus minus two is like three, but no, no, it's the whole difference. Four positive and two negative equals what? I'll phrase it in a way it might understand. Let's say you wake up with negative two bucks, and by the end of the day, you got four bucks. How much money did you make? You, you had negative two, now you got four, so you got at least four, but you got six dollars, yeah. So the difference between these two numbers is six, but the max is 0.5. See how that's out of spec? If the max is 0.5, the difference is 0.6. This is this car would be a problem. They may ask, is it in spec or out of spec? And you're like, I don't freaking know. It's 0.4 and negative 0.2 with the max of 0.5. Draw it out. Draw it out. Make sense?
So uh, one plus or minus three, you could do one plus or minus three. So, but do you guys understand how we came up with the six, right? Because this card would be at a spec and they could even go a level further and say, you know, if a car pulls, what's causing the pull, then it's your job to find out what's in spec or out of spec. So this one would be like, oh, whatever this is, if it was camber, you'd know like, okay, the camber's out of spec. If they're showing you a chart and something's out of spec, you should be able to catch it and you should know if camera's out of spec, what's it gonna cause. Then you do this, 0.4 positive, negative 0.2. Yeah, heck yeah, that car's pulling to the left. Not only because it's different, but because it's got a maximum of a half a degree allowable difference and you got a 0.6, that's fail. It's a fail and it causes a pull. Cool. So Daniel said one plus or minus three. That'd be kind of a crazy one. If you did a one plus or minus a three, let's go to that. Let's say it was one degree plus or minus a three. That would say your ideal is right here, but then you can go up three and you can go down three. That's a lot. What's one plus three? It'd be a four. What's one minus three? When you're way over here, what's one minus three? Your range on that one would be a negative two to a positive four. It's a huge range. So you can figure out the range. They're just gonna give you the specs. You can draw it on the number line. Being chilling, no biggie. All right, so how do you guys feel? We will cover math one more time, um, but that's gonna be during advanced alignments. This is at least going to, I want you guys to start chewing on this a little bit. Chewing the cud, as they say. Consider this, and then uh, tomorrow um, we'll do quite a bit more lab work. So people get on there and do some more alignments, but don't just focus on, how, you know, you got a, a week early demo to how to use the machine. Now I want you to know what you're adjusting, why you're adjusting it, how it's going to affect it. What's the spec? What's your target? How far, how high can you go? How low can you go? See what I'm saying? So now I want you to really clamp down on some of this alignment stuff. Roberto, go ahead. I'm confused on the one that you just wrote down. You said you said it was one plus or minus. 0.3. Yeah, so Daniel just put in the chat. If the, spec was, if the spec was one, here's your spec, right? This is perfect. This would be ideal. But it's got a big allowable tolerance it's saying one is perfect but like you can go up to three more and you can go up to three minus so that means one's good but you can go all the way down to negative 0.2 and all the way up to positive 0.4 that'd be like a big wide window i don't know if that's a real spec or just making it up we can make numbers up all day wouldn't it have to be 3.0 not 0 0.3 for it to go to four it oh this is supposed to be a minus i see how i got you that is that is a minus symbol right here. I got you. See that? Does that make more sense? Yeah. It's a it's a I should have typed it. I kind of knew. One plus or minus three. That's what I meant to say. Cool. So yeah. I think you guys got this. You can do some more work on it. But uh, overall, I think you're pretty decent. If you're nervous about it, you can skip ahead to the A4 prep. And I do have some questions like this that you can um, work on. So with that, that's the end of our lecture. I'm going to get the uh, I'm gonna get the um, Kahoot rolling. Madi, give me one second. Is it? Yeah, Madi, go ahead. See if it'll help the lecture. Uh I just want to ask about the eccentrics that you talked about. Okay. So I understand the concept behind the A thing that you said about the control arm. However, I didn't get, how could you tell on which side you want to turn the eccentric if you want to do this or this? Like, do you, should you try it on the car? So I see. Um, that's a good question. If you didn't get it, that means that the way I explained it isn't good enough. So... Let me pick a let me pick a slide and then we'll go over that, okay? Because I can do, I can do a little drawing too.
Okay, that eccentric was all right. Um, those eccentrics weren't. No, I must have. I must have passed it. Eccentric. Okay, this one's probably the best one I got. Now let me jump into the paint tools, annotate. I think I can do some painting. So Madi, this is the center line right here. See this? Let's just say that I want this rod to go outward this way. Cool, that way. What I would do is I would turn this this way because as you can see, if I turn it to the left, this bolt is going to come over here. See that? If the bolt's going to come over here, it's going to push the rod out. If I wanted to push it the other way, let's go with, I'm going to pick another color. Let's go with red. If I wanted to push this rod this way, then I would, then I would turn the bolt clockwise because it's going to bring the bolt more centered, more, more, more on this right side. If I'm bringing the bolt in the right side, it's pulling the rod to the right side. See what I'm saying? So you're looking at where the bolt is and we're gonna try to move it inside or outside. Cool. So that's, and that's why I pulled this one off. This has always been tough for me to demonstrate to get people to understand. And so I, I literally took this off of Audi suspension. Like that's when class was starting. So cool. Good question. If anybody else got a question, shoot it. Otherwise, we're going to call it and I'll put the, um, we'll do the lecture quiz, your favorite. All right, I think we're safe to say. I'm going to uh, 